Welcome along, everybody, to Spa Francorchamps in Belgium for the seventh round of the 2022 Intelligent Money British GT Championship. It's our annual visit to mainland Europe and the beginning of SRO's Speed Week, which uh, culminates in the Total Energy's Spa 24 hours in a week's time. This weekend, though, all attention is on the British GT teams and drivers as they head into the final part of what has been a very, very exciting 2022 campaign. Uh, the weather is rather un-spa-like, it must be said, mid 20s the ambient temperature but that track temperature is the significant one into the 40s already continuing to climb uh, it is 20 past 12 here local tires so we're getting into the hottest part of the day and tire management will be key when we get into the two hour race which is coming up very shortly Andy McEwen here in the commentary box David Addison alongside me David uh, the Spa-Francorchamps circuit looking better than ever the cars making their way out onto the circuit and as ever with British GT these days hard to know what we're in for over the next two hours it's a very unpredictable race it's a very jumble grid that's been changed and changed again with one or two cars back onto the original qualifying positions under appeal. We've had a couple of cars withdraw, one with a technical issue, one with uh, illness from, from drivers. We've had a few team crew members and drivers going down with food poisoning, so they're just not in this temperature able to race. So even in the last few minutes, different versions of grids have been issued, but we are ready for a proper endurance race, a two-hour sprint around this fantastic circuit that's got 19 corners 4.35 miles in length and it doesn't matter when you think it goes downhill even that is so steep uh, a descent you can't really benefit from it it's climbing all the time it is a real real challenge and this year more of a challenge in a sense because you've got lots of these uh, new gravel traps put in for motorbike racing very very close to the edge of the road there is one coming out of la source and what this means is that drivers can't now run wide but if they do and they bring gravel onto the road you're going to get punctures we've had a couple or three this weekend uh, the test day for the 24 hours of course had quite a few with lots and lots of cars on track all over the course of the day so towards the end of two hours i would think that, that tire management could become an issue they will change at the pit window i'm sure but even so longer race more scope for incident yeah i was chatting to marco signoretti who will start the academy mustang from pole in gt4 and he said the most consecutive laps he has done this weekend is seven he will do more than seven he hopes mm. at the start of this race so they are it is a bit of a voyage into the unknown of course many of the teams will have raced here before the track layout as you say hasn't changed at all but it is an awful lot hotter than we are used to here uh, at spa and it is a tough circuit on uh, on tires lots of high and medium speed constant radius corners uh, which will punish the pirelli rubber uh, but we do indeed have a very interesting grid here with barwell motorsport on pole position for the race a brilliant late effort there from Sandy Mitchell in that uh, fascinating combined qualifying sessions uh, yesterday afternoon uh, stealing, snatching the podium, uh, the uh, pole position away from Fox Motorsport, whose McLaren is up there on the front row. Uh, some uh, teams, I think, finding form here at Spa this weekend that we haven't seen at the sharp end all year. And David, as we get into the final part of the season and certain teams are really starting to look at the points now, having a few teams at the front who don't have to worry about the championship is good news for us. Could really spice things up. Absolutely so. And of course this with it being a longer race gets you more points for finishing anyway uh, there's more scope in a long race for more things to happen we saw it off the line last year well uh, one of uh, those agent provocateurs the ABBA racing Mercedes has been withdrawn because Sam Neary is uh, really struggling with food poisoning so that car has had to be withdrawn this is the pole position car the AMs will start in GT3, so Adam Ballard will go first. But Sandy Mitchell's lap yesterday was just outstanding. Uh, he stole pole position right at the very end, and Sandy, we know, goes well around here. Let's his, hear his thoughts going into this race. He's on the grid with Bryn Lucas. Yeah, one of the many championship protagonists this year. I mean, you're some 35 points back from Ian Loggy, but it's been a strange season for you guys. You've had some really good results and some stinkers too. Yeah, it's been really up and down, a bit of a roller coaster for us. Um, yeah, Silverstone obviously being the highlight with a pole and a win there. So, yeah, starting on pole again today, so it'd be nice if we can repeat that. But, um, yeah, 15, success, uh, 15 second success penalty is going to make that a bit more challenging today. And, um, you know, the pace of the grid's really, really high. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it and uh, see what we can do every time you get in the car and qualifying you have some work to do Adam's setting some decent times but he is making you work isn't he <laughs> yeah I mean the, a couple of the guys in the McLaren's yesterday were super quick in qualifying and kind of had that little edge and um, which meant yeah it was all to do in the pro quality but it was probably one of the best laps I've done in a, a very long time so I was really pleased to, to put that on the board and um, yeah like I say it's starting pole in the sunshine at Spa it doesn't get much better so we'll go out and enjoy the race and um, just do as much as we can 
Well, they've got an on board at the moment with Adam coming around the track, and I know you're talking to him all the time, but what's going through his mind as he, as he leads his way up to pole position? Yeah, I mean, he seemed quite relaxed today, you know, uh, second time starting on pole. Um, he got a really good start at Silverstone from pole, so we've had a good chat about, um, you know, strategy off the line and getting a good start and, um, you know, getting through the first few corners. I mean, I feel if we can get to turn five, uh, turn six uh, in the lead at the end of the straight there, then I think, you know, he's pretty strong in sector two. So, you know, I'm sure he'll be just focusing on uh, getting a good launch off the line, getting through the first couple of corners and, um, yeah, trying to get back into his rhythm and uh, try and build a gap from the cars behind. Well, cars are making their way to the grid now. Best of luck. Cheers, thanks. Well, they've got to be realistic challenges for a win, not only in terms of the pace, but Barwell has a really good track record here, not only from British GT, but from, but, but from also the 24 hours of Spa. So it's a shame we only have the one Barwell Lamborghini these days. But, you know, Mark Lemmer yesterday, when that car took pole position, was as animated as I've ever seen him. That pole meant a lot to that team. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, Barwell won this race a year ago with eventual champions uh, Liam Machitsky and Dennis Lind. So, uh, yeah, you're right. That car works well here. It was a brilliant effort, that, from Sandy Mitchell. But, of course, because uh, both drivers have to set a time in qualifying, which is then combined, it means they are genuinely there on pace. It's not just that Sandy Mitchell rescued mm. them. Oh no, this is drama. That's Mark Sansom in the gravel already in the Assetto Motorsport Bentley Continental. Now, I can't quite tell where that is. Uh, he's a long way off the track though, David, and that's not ideal when he hasn't even got to the grid yet. I was thinking it might be Brussel up at the top of the hill trying to look to the right. I think that's where the road goes, but it might even be further round the lap than that because there is dust settling over at Blanchimont. So uh, how are you getting to the gravel on your way to the grid? Well, we did actually have it in a GT2 race about an hour and a half ago. Oh, really? <laughs> um, that car was, was pulled out of the gravel, but this might delay the start whilst that is being attended to, and then the gravel's got to be swept out of the bottom of it. So let's try and piece it all together. That's uh, Adam Ballon going to the grid. Mark Sanson then is uh, the driver that we've got in strife. You're on board with it. It is Blanchimont, in fairness, and he turns in and off Ooh. he goes and into the barrier. Oh, that's done, damn it, that's out. Yes, we're not gonna see that car start the race at all. And that's a did real shame. Did something break to turn that off the road like that? Because he wasn't weaving to, to warm up the tires. It just suddenly went off. I'm a bit perplexed about all of that. Uh, anyway, we'll uh, scratch our heads about that. In the meantime, let's hear from the returning Jules Gounon. Welcome back. He's with Bryn Lucas. Yeah, it's great to see Jules here, a track you know really, really well, and you're kind of reunited with Ian Loggy, who's been doing pretty well in your absence. Yeah, they've been doing amazing. I've been following them because, for sure, I'm very interested on, on to see how is Yen doing. Callum did a fantastic job. They are leading the, Yen is leading the championship right now. We are starting a bit on the way back, let's say. I wasn't expecting that we start uh, there, but uh, we gave everything and uh, I was happy about the, my lap and Yen also. So, you know, it's a two-hour race, my first time two-hour race here. We saved a set of tires uh, during free practice, so we both have new tires. So I expect us to, to try some move. And um, like I told you in Nunton Park, send it a, a little bit. Send it, good luck. Thank you very much, guys. Looking forward to seeing Gilles Gounon send it in the car which <laughs> leads the championship, of course, for uh, Ian Loggy. Important race this for Loggy to score points in, and he, perhaps more than anybody else, will be concerned about uh, staying out of trouble in this race. Big championship lead, over 30 points clear he is of uh, Michael Igo and Phil Keane, and he just wants to protect, protect, protect that championship yeah. lead over the final three races, which can be easier said than done. There are some who will say he's owed a bit of bad luck. Did have a non-score at Silverstone, though, of course, so even for Loggy with that healthy championship yeah. lead, it's not been flawless. No, and we've made the point that this is a race where you get more points, so if you're in trouble, you're losing more points, if that makes sense. This is an opportunity for others to try to gain ground in the championship. There are lots of hard luck stories that we've got to, to pick out over the course of, of qualifying into the race, but there's a good news story. Marco Signoretti uh, on pole position in GT4 and alongside is Richard Williams in the Stella Motorsport Audi, which looks different, doesn't it? Because? Uh, because that is a new car. Indeed. They had a crack in the chassis. They discovered after Snetton, didn't they? Snetton, didn't they? So it is uh, a different chassis, different car, but again, going well. Um, yes. It was a good pace that that had yesterday. Marco Signoretti was a very happy man after his qualifying effort. He's never been here before, and he put the car onto pole position in his session. He's about to go racing after he's spoken to Bryn. Yeah, do you know what? Every time we come to a track with British GT, Marco, you're at a new circuit, except for Donington, so you're at Spa. It's looking pretty good so far for you. Yeah, sorry, I missed the end of that with the radio. Every track you're on is a brand new track for you, except for Donington. So Spa, uh, doing pretty well so far for you. Yeah, not bad. I love the track, and, you know, I've driven it in video games, but it's great to finally be here and, uh, you know, do these laps. 
you and yourself and Matt, talk us through the relationship. You two seem to be uh, pretty, pretty good, pretty tight. Yeah, we met each other at the beginning of the season. We're the same age and uh, we're really close and he helps me out every time we go to new tracks, especially in the UK, he really gets me up to speed quick. Best of luck, Marco. Yeah, so, Marco Signoretti there. Now, dominant is the only word we can use, really, to describe his qualifying performance yesterday. I can't remember, David, the last time I saw a driver go a full second quicker than anybody else in their mm. qualifying session. It was a mighty margin, it really was. Um, and, and Matt Cowley, uh, I, I can't remember, I was stood in the garage, but I can't remember if they put new tyres on for the second run, but Matt wasn't as quick as Marco. I think they left it on the original rubber, but uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, but it was a very, very good effort, and that car just really likes this circuit. Uh, Seb Hopkins could be another man to watch in GT4, and uh, Bryn has found him just before we go racing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you finished 7th, 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 8th, a 4th, uh, Donny, so, you know, the results are getting there, aren't they? You must be hopeful for a podium this time out. Yeah, definitely. I think we've, we've always been hopeful for a podium you know those those results where we've been lower down they've been either because of penalties or you know just other mechanical issues so we always know every weekend where we can where we can be fighting at the front and so hopefully this weekend can all be all pieced together like we wanted yeah and the Cayman's looking pretty good around here it's hooking up well yeah yeah I think it's a really good all-round car that's why we've been you know we've been really solid pace wise everywhere on the tracks but we just need it all to piece together and hopefully this is the weekend so we'll be fighting for the front hopefully cheers Seb good Thank luck you very much Still looking for their first podium, that driver pairing, but they've been close a couple of times and the car looks uh, looks good this weekend. Speaking of cars looking good, GT cars in the sunshine, one of the great circuits. Uh, David, this is a special moment to have a wander down the grid and uh, uh, get up close and personal with uh, some fabulous machinery. Where you've got, for example, McLaren and Mercedes alongside one another. Uh, keep scrolling back, the Porsches more numerous this weekend and there is the Bentley, which is out of the gravel, but is not going to be on the grid. Uh, whether it's allowed to start late from the pit lane, we'll have to wait and see. More McLarens are uh, there poised, ready to go. The uh, Team Parker Racing Porsche joined by the Allied Racing owned Redline Racing Run car. You've gone past that. There's the TPR entry. That gap is where the Bentley should have been. But look what is next to that gap. A long way back on the grid, the Michael Igo Lamborghini. He's another one suffering from health. Not food poisoning, though. Uh, no, tonsillitis is uh, his ailment this weekend. He was feeling very rough yesterday and apparently hasn't improved to the point that he didn't go out at all in morning warm up, did mm. he? He left all the driving to Phil Keane. Uh, so that's a bit of a shame. Second in the championship, that car needs to make progress. GT4 there, the Academy Mustang on pole, the Stella Audi, which lost the championship lead uh, with a non-score after a penalty at Snetterton a few weeks ago. Then our racing third alongside the team Parker came and our racing uh, Josh Miller and Jamie Day, the youngest ever driver pairing to win a British GT race. Paddock Motorsport and the Toyota next and a big healthy, varied GT4 field, David. Uh, we miss, though, I'm afraid to say, the James Wallace uh, McLaren, because uh, that car's got a turbo problem, and James is another one that's got the dreaded lurgy, the food poisoning. Uh, number 90, Will Burns, he's also been struggling. Now, uh, they were trying to get a change of start driver from Will, uh, but the stewards weren't up for that. So I think Will is going to try and do the minimum, which will be um, for GT4, 58 minutes. The Toyota you touched on, that had a new turbo overnight, not because there was anything wrong particularly with the old one. It's just that Toyota had identified that that's one of the oldest racing uh, GR Supras and said, we've got this new turbo now, which will give you about a second a lap, at which point Christian Dick got out his wallet <laughs> and said... Uh, how much? And the mechanic said, oh, no, and they had a long night fixing that. But uh, that car was going really well. And as long as Jordan Collard keeps it away from the track limit dramas of yesterday, that should be good for a, a decent result. Yeah, he had at least two of his qualifying laps deleted for exceeding track limits. So his ultimate lap that he did set, the one flying lap that he set, um, was far from his quickest. So expect that car to move forward once the race gets underway, which thankfully isn't that far away now. The grid is almost cleared of team personnel, VIPs and officials. And once that happens, has been done we will send them on their way around the spa circuit the 4.35 mile spa francorchamps circuit and it will be the green and black lamborghini from the pole position which leads them around adam ballon at the wheel that one win at silverstone two races of the six we've had so far they failed to score at though and in the background it will be a non-score surely today for a set of motorsports bentley uh, the team stayed up all night on friday night to fix a, a cracked exhaust manifold in that car they got it sorted mark was really feeling good about the race uh, and unfortunately it's all gone wrong yeah i mean depending on how bad the damage is it could join in late but you can see some of the damage on the front left and it's what you can't see uh, on the front right underneath so yeah if, if they can get it going and they can join in late at least to get some mileage it would sort of make the trip worthwhile i guess 
but we are in for two hours of drama. Uh, it's a sort of mini enduro, this, isn't it? And uh, two hours flat out. It, it doesn't have the, the biggest amount of strategy involved. You really, you try and get as close to the hour mark as you can, driver change, fuel tires, bang, bad out again. But what it does prove is who's got the fast car around here because they are two one-hour sprints nailed together. Uh, absolutely, and uh, we're expecting some uh, lively racing in the early stages. Those McLarens, very good on your straight line, will be trying to capitalise at the start. So it is the Lamborghini of Adam Ballon then on pole position for Barwell Motorsport. Fox Motorsports, Nick Hulstead second, and he has been quick this weekend. He'll be wanting that lead on lap one for sure. Then it's the two-season Mercedes of James Cottingham and Morgan Tilbrook, winner at Donington Park for Enduro Motorsport, lining up fourth. Row three then for Super Sub, Graham Davidson in the Paddock Motorsport car, and Ian Loggy, the championship leader, starting sixth, and desperately hoping he stays out of trouble through the first few corners. Alex Malikin's red line car is also a championship contender, albeit a Porsche now, not a Lamborghini. John Ferguson's Ram Racing Mercedes is eighth, our most recent winner in GT3. Rounding out the top ten, it's Stuart Proctor for Greystone GT, and Mia Fluin, who is one of the quicker AM drivers in her qualifying session yesterday, will round out the top ten. Then it is another Greystone GT car, race by race entry for Ian Campbell with Nick Jones in the Team Park Racing Porsche starting 12th. The seventh row for Mark Sansom, not for Mark Sansom. We know he is in the pit lane with a damaged Bentley. So Michael Igo, second in the points, starts on his own on that seventh row. Row eight then for Simon Watts for Team Rocket RJN. David Holloway in for Betty Chen this weekend at Century Motorsport is 16th. And then the 17th uh, position on the grid, filled out by our pole sitter in GT4, Marco Signoretti, looking to convert that dominant qualifying pace into to a race victory. His Mustang has the erstwhile championship leading Audi alongside, started by Richard Williams. Second row then in GT4, it's Josh Miller for our racing, the Aston Martin ahead of the Team Parker Racing Porsche Cayman of Jamie Orton looking for that team's first podium of the year. Ashley Marshall's GT4 Paddock McLaren is next alongside Jordan Collard, who as I said had those issues with track limits in qualifying. Joe Wheeler in the Assetto Motorsport Genetta that Freddie Tomlinson crashed in practice yesterday is 23rd overall. And Matt Topham in the Newbridge Aston Martin, which leads the GT4 points is deep on the grid. Then it's James Wallace, Wallace in the Motors One Racing McLaren. Aaron Morgan for Team Brit is next. Had a puncture early on in warm-up earlier on this morning. Will Burns, if he's well enough to do the stint, will begin it from 27th with Kevin Say in an all-am entered Herbert Motorsport. Porsche is next. Then it's Tom Rawlings. And Lucky Kira making his first appearance in GT4 for Valuga Racing. Lucky has raced in GT3 and GTC and now GT4. So all three of the currently available categories within uh, British GT Lucky Kera has now made at least one appearance in. So that's how the grid lines up then. They form up two by two on the run towards Blanchimont. On the left is the pole-sitting Lamborghini. On the right, the orange and blue McLaren. And I think Nick Holstead's going to be on his toes here, David, to try and get that lead early. We know the McLaren is good up that Kevel straight. Yeah, but I would put a, a few euros on James Cottingham being in the lead because James knows Spa like the back of his hand. He's done many a mile around here in historic racing, and he's a very, very quick GT driver, as we have seen. So, yeah, I think the first few corners are going to be very lively indeed, but it's whether people are prepared to take the the risk on the first few corners or play the long game last year playing the long game never came into anybody's brains i don't think off the start let's see what happens here gt4 grid remember a little bit separated it lags back from gt3 but two hours of drama is set to get underway here we go then the seventh round of the intelligent money british gt championship the 30th season of british gt it's been an absolute cracker so far what does our visit to the belgian hillsides have in store for us then it is the lamborghini of adam ballon from pole position two by two out of the chicane when the lights go out they can accelerate away it's a slightly spread out start we are about to go racing then lights out away we go and cottingham is away well from third he tries to get up the inside of ballon there's a squeeze the lamborghini hangs on that was almost drama immediately around the outside goes holster looking back there from the uh, leading Lamborghini. Is it still the leader? Yes, it is. Ballon just about chops across the nose of Holstead and Cottingham straight through into second place as well. Holstead down to third and that's the Paddock McLaren into fourth because the Enduro car, David, is losing ground. And Alex Malikini on his toes looking at the Porsche. Ian Loggy went to the outside line into La Source waiting to see where the gaps were. He was taking it very sensibly indeed, letting any drama go on the inside. So Adam Ballon it is who leaves then. James Cottingham is second as they make the climb up towards Le Corne for the first time. Now the Mercedes trying to gobble up the gap in the background. Look, John Ferguson in the blue and white Ram Racing Mercedes dodges out of the draft, but Cottingham there trying to attack, trying to defend at the same time. Yeah, into Le Corne. They go to a rest further back. That's uh, Nick Jones in the Team Parker Porsche up the inside of Ian Campbell's McLaren and makes the move stick on the way into the chicane, then down towards Brussels, and that's Morgan Tilbrook trying to regain that fourth position. He's battling away with Graham Davidson, who said that he wanted to be in a podium place halfway around the first lap. He's not quite there, but he is in fourth place and fending off the Donington race winning car. 
So down towards Speaker's Corner, ignore the motorbike track on the inside, the conventional route for the cars, and down towards Pont, Adam Ballon, now that the tyres are kicking in, is starting to maintain that gap over James Cottingham, isn't he? But it's the battle of the McLarens, really, for third place and back, where it's all happening. There's also that GT4 contest to keep an eye to as well, and we've had a switch there, have we? Yes, we have. The Audi ahead I caught in the background there, so good start by Richard Williams, ahead of Marco Signoretti now. That is significant, because Signoretti has a success penalty to serve later on, and really wanted to capitalise on that qualifying pace to build a gap in the early stages of the race. Right, so they're heading towards the end of lap one. Interesting to watch uh, Ian Loggy on this opening lap. He's not really that keen, it doesn't seem, on sitting on the back of that battle pack up front. He's just quietly driving his own first lap, his own stint, letting the tyres come to temperature and keeping out of trouble, handing the car over there or thereabouts for Jules Gounon, but we'll see what he can do within the hour mark. It's points and it's a championship uppermost in Ian Loggy's mind as now Morgan Tilbrook tries to work out where he can make that move against Graham Davidson, but the McLarens third, fourth and fifth have fallen away a little bit, haven't they? Because the top two are almost together at the end of the lap. Adam Ballon ahead of James Cotton who's had some pretty rotten luck this year. He's got great pace in that car, and he's staying on the tail of the Barwell Lamborghini at the end of the opening lap. Yeah, Cottingham was really brave through Blanchimont. That is, of course, the, the uh, corner at which Ballon had an off a few years ago when running in a good position, so perhaps he was a bit circumspect through there on cold tyres. Holstead in third, struggling to go with them, as you said, and these three McLarens now bunching themselves together. There were talks of McLaren domination after the BOP changes after practice yesterday. Not the case. The Lamborghini Mercedes getting away, and the fight is for third, then Holstead with his wing mirrors full on the red and white enduro car heading through Radion. Signoretti in the Mustang has dropped back to uh, effectively 20th place overall. That means that he's about sixth within GT4. Now, that might be that it was a very conservative first lap. It might be that he's had a bit of a drama somewhere because that's a lot of places to lose as the leaders now come up towards Le Corne. The gap at the end of the opening lap was seven tenths of a second. And in the first sector, James Cottingham is three tenths quicker than the leading Lamborghini. So it's game on, I reckon, here for the race lead. I go not making progress. David Holloway there, side by side with James Watts, who goes around the outside. Watts takes the place then in the Rocket RJN. Uh, McLaren, so uh, sorry, Simon Watts gains that place over David Holloway, who was in the gravel in FP1, and that's Michael Igo trying to gain ground on the inside down to Brussels. But Ian Campbell fends him off just. Yeah, I go a long way down the order, not feeling very well, but he is a racer, will always get stuck into the fight when he can, yeah. and looks a bit quicker than the McLaren at this stage. Adrenaline is a great healer, yes. though, isn't it? Now he's gone racing. Let's see. Uh, look at the top two. They are getting away, no question about it, from Nick Halstead. But for the race lead, Adam Ballon now starting to feel some of that pressure being applied by that grunt and go Mercedes of James Cottingham. And we've already got track limit warnings coming. Uh, one of them has gone to Ian Campbell, and the other one has gone in GT4 to the number 65. Uh, Team Parker Porsche as look back from Ballon. The cars sprint through the court, Paul Frere. Seven tenths of a second at the start of the lap, and in both sectors, costing him a fraction quicker. Yeah, he looked good through that middle sector, didn't he? He's taking mm. nice, wide, sweeping lines. Ballon turning in a bit early to the corners, maybe just watching his mirrors a bit too much. Through Blanchemont, this is where the Mercedes gained a lap ago. And again, I'd say the gap is creeping down. Is he close enough to get up the inside into the chicane? He's some way back and early into the race. We're not even five minutes into this race. James Cottingham sensibly decides not to go for the lunge. It's Instead, focuses on exit speed. Now he couldn't be much closer to the back of the Lamborghini as they race across the start finish line. The second lap is completed. A flash on the headlights, a look to the inside. He's late on the brakes into the first corner. Surely he's going to go for it. Yes, he does. James Cottingham tries to get to the apex. There's almost contact. And Ballon just by the skin of his teeth hangs on. That was very close indeed. You can see what James is trying to pull. Didn't quite work. So nose to tail, they drop down towards Eau Rouge this time. This is lap three. Adam Ballon looking at this. And there, James Cottingham skims the wall just brush the geese, the concrete as they come down past the old pits, rides the curb out of a rouge. James, of course, experiencing Spa really for one of the first times with proper downforce. Most of the cars he's raced around here with uh, limited aero and uh, lots and lots of oversteer, but this car sticking to the ground, giving him that confidence to attack, but he breaks a fraction earlier than the Lamborghini maybe going up towards Le Corne. And is that helping the McLarens come back at them? Yeah, Nick Halstead was uh, about 1.7 seconds behind Cottingham at the start of the lap in the first sector alone. He's nine tenths faster, so he's right there with them now. Three for the lead. But Cottingham is stuck. So there's the McLaren. But yeah, on this part of the circuit, James Cottingham has got himself right up onto the back of the race leader. Halstead is almost there. And the other car 
Star to watch. He's going to be sixth now. Alex Malikin's Porsche closing on the McLaren. So it's Halstead third. It's Davidson fourth. It's Tilbrook fifth. Cottingham, fastest lap of the race. Last time around. Down they turn towards Pont. Cottingham knows he's got to get on with this before the McLaren there catches him. Yeah, absolutely. Through the double left they go. Then up towards the uh, right left at Fania. Quick mention of GC4, by the way. Jordan Collard's come from sixth on the grid to second in the Speedworks Toyota. That is a remarkable start for him, making up for his errors in qualifying yesterday. So uh, when we can drag our eyes... Oh, in fact, he's got the lead. He's ahead of the Audi now. So the Toyota leads as they go out of Bruxelles, and they're all very, very close to the front. Look, Toyota, Audi, Aston Martin, Ford Mustang, Porsche and McLaren in the distance. This is what GT4 is all about. What a rocket ship first laps, though, from Collard. Absolutely, yeah. So this new turbo giving that car a little bit more pace, and it's going really, really strongly. And Jordan, of course, knows this circuit, having raced in GT4 last year, switching from McLaren to Toyota. Uh, I think there was a bit of finger-wagging yesterday about the track limit offences, and, and Jordan told to just keep it between the white lines and channeling all that pace now into a really good drive. As you say, sixth on the grid into the class lead, and he's also just edging away, isn't he? He's cleared the traffic, and now, look, he's starting to get away as four, five, six for the lead. Look at this battle pack in GT3 out of the chicane. It's still Ballard, Cottingham, Halster, Davidson, Tilbrook, Malik in the order, but the margin first to six is 2.4 seconds, and Tilbrook fifth has now done the fastest lap of the race. Yeah, Morgan Tilbrook is starting to warm to this, isn't he? So the top six go out of La Source almost before seventh place man Ian Loggy had appeared into sight further back, as there's an issue there for Graham Davidson, yep. slow out of La Source, two places dropped. Exactly, yeah, because Malikin has cleared him, and so also is Tilbrook. Now, let's just see whether the Paddock Motorsport car survives. It does, but, yeah, you're right, it had dropped pace, lost two places, but yet now appears to have picked up the speed again. And look at Halston, he's alongside Cottingham for second place. The yellow Mercedes has the power in a straight line. The McLaren switches sides. And Nick Halstead now tries to go for the inside line under braking. He's got the line for the corner, but he's not late enough on the brakes. And James Cottingham, great defence, hangs on to second place. And now Tilbrook's on his toes to challenge a delayed Halstead. We did tell them it's a two-hour race, didn't we? This is fantastic stuff. The top six all over each other. And that does now drop uh, uh, Halstead back into the clutches of Tilbrook behind. Tilbrook, of course, gaining a place at the expense of Graham Davidson, who you're absolutely right, David, is still hanging on there so I wonder if Graham maybe dipped a wheel into that new gravel trap coming out of La Source and that will have lost him traction lost him speed all of this at the moment just relieving the pressure slightly from Adam Ballam but if Cottingham can regroup here get back away from Halstead which he's starting to do then I suggest he's going to be back on the tail of the Lamborghini very shortly don't disagree with that at all he wants those McLarens to start fighting I'm fascinated to see how Alex Malikian fares now in that Porsche new to him but he's raced at least a Porsche in the past he raced in the Cayman Challenge last year in the UK so Ballam beats Cottingham but that gap, I reckon, is going to be down by the end of the lap. Trouble is that Cottingham is still taking Halstead with him. He needs to back Halstead into Tilbrook, let them squabble, and then he can get away and concentrate on the race lead once more. But Ballon, for the moment, does have the advantage. It was six tenths over the line. It looks greater than that. As you see, the Audi has now fallen to third in GT4. Signoretti, in contrast, is picking his way back up the order. So I think we had him sixth. He's now up to fourth. Yes, he is. So that is now the R Racing Aston Martin of Josh Miller into second place in the class. Winner at Snetterton last time out, and there are the car that won at Donington Park, the Academy Ford Mustang, not going according to the script this for Academy. They thought they'd be well up the road uh, by this point, and uh, that is certainly not the case. Now, back to the GT3 leaders out of the chicane, and that's a good exit there from Morgan Tilbrook. Tries to get the overlap with Holstead, but he doesn't want the outside. He wants the inside into La Source, and he might just get there. No, Nick chops across his nose and defends the place. But wide in and tight out could equally be the answer. So is there going to be a gap on exit? Yes, there is. Can Morgan Tilbrook squirt up the inside? He tries. Malikin kicks up the dust in the the background, the two McLarens are almost overlapping. So it's the blue-hued uh, car of Morgan Tilbrook going for third place. He's got the line for Eau Rouge. They are absolutely together, but Morgan Tilbrook's bravery prevails. Through he goes, bounces out wide. They both run wide back onto the racetrack. Here comes Malikin, who's got the momentum. So it is Lamborghini from Mercedes, and then it's McLaren, McLaren, Porsche, McLaren all tripping over themselves. Malikin gets up alongside Halstead. He's cleared him. Here comes Davidson back to the party as well in the red and white paddock motorsport car that breaks ludicrously late. Gets up the inside, terrorises Malikin out of the way, and Davidson sixth to fourth. 
fantastic move. Fantastic, absolutely. Graham Davis in three, but now he's offline going out of Lake Com. That was a strange run through there. And so Malikin might come back at him into Brussels. No, he's not quite close enough. So three wide into Lake Com, two places gained for Davidson. And still, Ballon can't really escape because this is now allowing Cottingham to break away from the McLarens and Porsche and chase back after the leader. If you can find me a team manager from the pit lane who is not watching this with his hands over his eyes, I'll be amazed because right now, everybody must be thinking, oh, there's an hour and 49 minutes to go, calm down. But it's a great battle going on up front. And now, without the McLaren pressure from behind, James Cottingham's Mercedes, look, is right back onto the tail of Adam Ballon. Trouble is, he's got another McLaren hunting him down. And this time, it is Morgan Tilbrook's car. There it is, number 77 then. So through turns the Enduro Motorsport car of the Fun Cup graduate and Alex Malikin, one up and one back. The Porsche is still fifth. I think Tilbrook is the fastest in this group, though, because as soon as he got into that clear air, clear air, he started to pull away. There goes the championship leader, Loggy. Then it is his Ram Racing teammate, John Ferguson. And then, look, another battle pack here. Now, the two Greystone McLarens are in here, sandwiching uh, Mia Fluid's Sky liveried uh, 76 McLaren. But the lead battle is where it's at as they head towards Blanchemont. And again, Cottingham's close now, closer than he's been at this part of the circuit for quite some time. Runs a touch wide, though. Bit of aero wash, maybe, running in the dirt air of the leading Lambo, and as they head into the braking zone at the chicane, Ballon still feeling the need to defend, but does hang on to the advantage. Tilbrook's there, though, and that was Cottingham's half a lap to have a go without having to watch his mirrors. Now Tilbrook's arrived, but James has to go back to attacking and defending simultaneously. But the gap has really widened between third and fourth. Tilbrook to Davidson as they cross the strike. 1.4 seconds. Here is Cottingham again. Break late, 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 late into La Source. Mm. The danger is he's left the door open for Tilbrook. But no, the McLaren couldn't get up the inside. So James Cottingham then trying to attack and defend, as you say. But Adam Ballon, unaffected by all of this, he's a bit like a sponge, isn't it? It doesn't matter what is uh, being applied pressure-wise from behind. He just soaks it all up. But he's got to do so for at least 47 more minutes, ideally, as they climb the hill once more. Behind them, Ian Loggy is seven. His teammate John Ferguson is eighth. Stuart Proctor is ninth. Ian Campbell is tenth. And he's Cottingham near enough to have a go. No, but Tilbrook thinks about going to second place. Pulls out, pulls back in again. Cottingham wants that race lead. Commits to the inside line, but he could not do it. No, still no way through. And again, that backs him up through the middle of the Lacom sequence. They're all tripping over each other slightly. Cottingham not on the ideal line there into the final right-hander at that chicane, uh, but does hold on to second position then. And now slowly but surely, Graham Davidson is starting to bridge the gap to them as well, uh, with Malikin now back behind. Nick Halstead. That was happening in the background as they went up the Kemmel Strait. And so Nick Halstead gets the Fox Motorsport, the yo-yoing Fox Motorsport McLaren back into the top five now. Meanwhile, GT4 has seen, of course, lots more overtaking because now Signoretti is ahead of Richard Williams and so too uh, goes the Team Parker Porsche of, Jam of uh, Jamie Orton there. So Jamie Orton drops the Audi down another position. A real up and down race here for people in both classes. It seems that once you get a place, you're not guaranteed to hang on to it. No, dear, but that's one of the beauties of Spa because, of course, it's a circuit where cars have their strengths and weaknesses uh, and also there are different places where you can use a tow to overtake and it's got everything going for it this place as you ride on board then with the Audi uh, there's a report of contact between uh, number 40 of Nick Halstead and uh, Alex Malikin uh, in their little battle perhaps a no surprise that but uh, they have persevered as you ride now on board with the Audi of Richard Williams heading up towards Le Combe. There, number 90 BMW, Will Burns, eager to get to the end of his stint. Then he can go and take on more liquids, feeling decidedly second-hand about life. Williams coming back at Jamie Orton, though, here. So the bullet-shaped Cayman has got the Audi R8 right there behind. The only Audi representation on the grid, which in modern GT racing is a real surprise. Out wide goes Orton. Williams not quite able to take advantage, though. Yeah, Orton carried too much speed then into Brussels. It's a downhill corner, easy to understeer through there anyway. Oops. Oh, and around goes Tilbrook from third place. Morgan Tilbrook around exiting the chicane. There was contact, but whether he was sideways already, we couldn't quite see. And he's going to have to do a three-point turn to get going. That's a real shame for Enduro Motorsport. Tilbrook didn't actually have the fastest lap. That's just been set by Nick Holstead, but he looked rapid, and now he's going nowhere. Yeah, because now he's either stalled it and or can't find reverse gear to go backwards, so no damage, but he didn't have the lock to complete the turn, so it means that Ballon leads Cottingham by half a second. Graham Davidson is up to third. Halstead is fourth. Malikin is fifth. Ian Loggy, slowly, slowly, catchy pointy. He's up to sixth, uh, so getting that car into the mix. He's still eight seconds back from all of this drama going on up front, so now James Cottingham again, for the moment at least, does not have to worry about a McLaren right behind him, but on this lap, nor can he make his move for the race lead. 
lead and there's a green flag waving at the exit of the chicane suggesting that the McLaren has just got going again I'll confirm that when it comes across the line but I don't think it has got going yet it's just to say to people that they've got to the end of that incident zone now Davidson is coming back at Cottingham and he's taking Halstead with him four for the lead now and you can see that bit of trim damage on the right front corner of Halstead's fourth place uh, McLaren so he has had contact now this is what happened to Tilbrook then through the chicane he's got Davidson behind him into the second apex and uh, there's a yes. bit of a wobble he's delayed gets off the throttle and Davidson had no time to react gets into the back of it but it was also a slightly odd line from Morgan Tilbrook it looked more like he was heading into the pit lane and then he tried to cut across to the apex and that's where Davidson was so there is the car and he just cannot get it going again he turned it and he hasn't got the lock to complete the move and now he doesn't seem like he's got the ability to go backwards it's under investigation that incident but the car is stuck for the moment uh, and that has championship implications because enduro were joint fourth in the championship and now he gets going critically without losing a lap yeah. but he has fallen right behind all of the gt4 cars uh, but yes joint fourth in the points and only actually three and a half points behind second place they dragged themselves back into championship contention with that win at donnington two top fives at snetterton and it could all have been undone there with that spin it's cost him a minute and 40 seconds, give or take. So very, very time consuming. Marcus Klassen will be distraught in the pit lane. It's going to be looked at, and it would not be a surprise, would it, to see a penalty go the way of number 11, because there was contact. However you, you dress it up, there was contact, and it turned around Morgan Tilbrook. And then it was a very, very long delay. Uh, that wasn't Graham Davidson's fault, but the uh, delay certainly is compounded the problems. Leaders go through, still Adam Ballon leads the way. Nobody else has got up there, despite everything else that we've been describing. That car still leads the way. Seven laps are in the book. And again, James Cottingham comes under renewed attack from Graham Davidson, who might be on borrowed time in third place. And then Nick Halstead fourth. Yeah, Graham's got to put that to the back of his mind now. They'll just try and go on the attack. If he can get into second, then you have to feel that he can chase down Ballon as well. But Adam uh, now seven tenths up the road from Cottingham. That's about the biggest the gap's been through this first 17 and a half minutes of racing. This race already flying by. Now out of Radion, Rod Radion even, up the Kemmel straight and the slipstream now coming into effect for Davidson. Can he poke out to the inside? Yes, he can. And we know he's good on the brakes here. So the Paddock Motorsport McLaren up the inside into Lacom later on the brakes, gets to the corner first and goes into second place. As long as he makes the corner, which he does, he will hold that second and they've all caught Ballon again. They have, but Adam is not putting a wheel out of line, is he? He is inch perfect here. Let's now see what Graham Davidson can do. The stewards are busily looking at that incident so it won't be a surprise necessarily if there's another part to that story is out of Bruxelles they come you turn in and then you have to turn a bit tighter second apex of that corner Graham Davidson drops down towards speaker's corner so the paddock motorsport McLaren that he shares with Martin Plowman getting itself back up the order once more fifth on the grid second on the road it runs indeed and the team manager sorry Andy of that car to race control Ah, that's never a good sign. Right, OK, more news on that when we get it. Meanwhile, on board with Ballon, looking back through the rear diffuser of the Barwa Motorsport Lamborghini, you could see that gap ebbing and flowing through the high-speed corners. It looks as though Davidson is struggling to follow in the dirty air, but then as soon as we get into a tighter section, like the uh, Piff Paff chicane there, the Fania chicane, he's able to close back in on the Lambo, into campus then, then call Paul Frey, and then it's flat out all the way up the hill towards Blanchimont, and then into the next real overtaking opportunity, the last couple of corners at the chicane. That's where it all went a bit wrong there between Davidson and Tilbrook a couple of laps ago, but Graham will already have forgotten about that because he's got a sniff at the race lead. Indeed so, and now Cottingham dropping away, isn't he? He's having to go defensive against Nick Halstead, but having lost that second place to Graham Davidson, the pace of that Mercedes, at least on this lap, just looks like it's faded a touch. Yeah, he's in a bit more dirty air, I guess, now as Davidson goes for it on the inside there. That's a late lunge from a long way back and was never that likely to work. But maybe that wasn't the idea. Maybe the idea was simply to fill the mirrors of Adam Ballon's car. And it's worked because he's slow off the chicane on the inside. Goes Davidson, there's contact as they come towards the line. And that almost ended in complete disaster. There was a hint of a gap on the inside. Davidson wanted to fill it and Ballon was having none of it. Now Adam defends into La Source. Again, continuing to take these tight lines in. That slows the Lamborghini on exit, but he squirts out of the La Source hairpin still hit the race lead and now with a bit of a witness mark on the left front corner of the McLaren presumably a matching one on the right rear corner of the Lamborghini but the battle rages on 
Alex Malikian has dropped back in fourth place, but he is now lapping quicker again as he tries to play catch-up. So here for the race lead comes Graham Davidson. This is what James Cottingham was never quite able to do on the run up Camel Strait. It's going to the outside line. We know the McLaren has got good pace, and Graham Davidson looks like he's ahead. Alan Ballon lets him go, does he? And through he goes. That McLaren is dynamite in a straight line, is it not? But Adam Ballon equally doesn't want to pick a fight with an hour and 39 minutes to go, especially if that number 11 McLaren is being looked at. And straight away, look, we're back to Ballon versus Cottingham, but Davidson has caught, passed, pulled away. He got past all of them. Remember, he started fifth on the grid. He's leading now inside the first, let's call it, 20 minutes of the race. Uh, good in a straight line, yes, but actually we saw from that on board with Ballon that Graham was just more committed over the top of Radion, carried more speed, and that translates then into a few more kilometres an hour up the straight, and he had the slipstream, uh, and in the end, it all made, it was made to look fairly easy as he drove around the outside of the Barwa Motorsport Lamborghini. Through Puan we go then. Davidson uh, leading the race and getting away. And also the Enduro McLaren, Bryn tells me that uh, Morgan Tilbrook had hit the pit speed restrictor button, so that's why he couldn't select reverse, because if you're going down the pit lane with that button depressed, you shouldn't be in reverse gear. So he had to disconnect all of that, go through that process, then he could find reverse. So that's why they lost more time. Uh, so that is uh, useful to know, even if it's rather depressing news for number 77. Now, uh, we've got, as the cars turn their way through, Mia Fluitt having not got to the middle sector, and there she is, that is Mia Fluitt who is off the road at Eau Rouge, is it? And she's out of the car and OK, but it looks like the car's hit something. She is out of the car, which is the good news, but I can't imagine that's going to sit by the edge of the road. So this could be a safety car period, couldn't it, to get that out of harm's way? You'd have to imagine so. That is the extended runoff area at the top of Radion in front of the very impressive new grandstand, which I'm sure uh, many spectators are taking advantage of. And you can see, the, yes, the skid marks there. She's lost it going into the right-hander, and the car's then overcorrected almost uh, back to the left. We'll see exactly what happened in a moment or two. What we do know is that the safety car is being scrambled, and all that hard work from Graham Davidson to get the lead and start pulling away is now undone. He was too seconds clear of Ballon at the start of the lap. That will now come down to absolutely nothing. And of course, for those who have success penalties to serve at the pit stops, this is also bad news because any advantage they gained over their opponents will now be lost with just over half an hour before those pit stops. Good news for Ian Loggy though, isn't it? Yes, Brings him back into the yes. mix. Good news for Jules Gounon for the second stint. So Mia Fluit walks away and uh, it might be, of course, that there was a bit of help in that. We'll try and piece it together in due course. But right now, the leaders go past the incident zone. Peter Daly, who is the race director, calls for the safety car. So Lorna Vickers, the safety car driver, will head out onto the circuit. The cars, you know, the, the drill can't overtake while they're behind the safety car. And Graham Davidson had that pass just in time, didn't he? Because he just got across the timing line when the safety car was called for. So he leads the queue, but what he can't now do is get away. There is the Lotus safety car making its way uh, up the hill. The Bentley, by the way, uh, so badly damaged, they're not even going to try to repair that. So uh, that is uh, not going any further whatsoever, as uh, it's a real, real shame that Mark Sanson's off earlier on. So we've got cars playing catch up to join the queue. Uh, of course, the GT4 field gain a place collectively. That's going to put Jordan Collard up into 14th overall now. Uh, indeed, yes. Uh, he was leading the class by about three seconds or so as well, over Josh Miller, second, Marco Signoretti, third in the Mustang, Jamie Orton, fourth in the Porsche, Richard Williams, fifth in the Audi, and Ashley Marshall, sixth in the McLaren. Then it was Joe Wheeler in the Ginetta. So uh, that, uh, again, shows that variety at the front of the field. Just behind them, by the way, is Morgan Tilbrook. Now, he's another who will gain massively out of this because yeah. he's gained over a minute. Yes, he's still mired in the middle of the GT4s, but he should make short work of them once the race gets back underway. Uh, it's definitely a net gain from where he was after the spin then yes where did we have him he was virtually last wasn't he yeah. so uh yeah he's he's gained ground certainly so there is michael igo in number 18 uh lamborghini going now down through the uh bruxelles left uh, right hander i should say and the safety car with the lights are flashing comes down the hill so race order doesn't change you can't overtake of course while the safety car is out this allows the race to carry on albeit under controlled conditions and uh Mere fluid out of the race, sad to say. Lucky Carer brings up the rear at the moment. The Ferrari Challenge champion, Carrera Cup race, you name it, he's raced it. Lucky Carer over the years. BMW Challenge, uh, Brick Car, GT Cup, um, all comers races. Uh, uh, what have I missed? I mean, he's done so many different categories. But anyway, he's, uh, as you're making the point, new to GT4 and learning about that car all the while at the rear of the field.
indeed. And uh, again, we'll gain out of the safety car slightly. Matt Topham struggling within GT4, isn't he? Now, he's an AM driver amongst Silvers, but he's dropped behind another AM driver, Kevin Say. Uh, that's a generous AM ranking, I would say, for Kevin, but he is in an all AM run Porsche, and he's caught and overtook uh, Matt Topham, who in the championship leading Aston Martin is now third from last. Uh, I understand from 76 that Mia Fluid had contact with Michael Igo, so there's a bit more to that story. And uh, Enduro are saying to Race Control, can you get the GT4 cars to hurry up and catch the queue of GT3? Because <laughs> obviously, as you just made the point, they're in that mix, but you've got two very distinct waves at the moment. They started as two waves and the gap's grown. So Jordan Collard, uh, certainly for, for uh, Marcus Clutton's point of view, would be uh, very popular if he did a best lap of the race now and caught up to everybody else. Uh, but you've got to think of this from Jordan's perspective. He doesn't care how close he is to the GT3 cars. No. What's the point in pounding around behind the safety car, putting extra wear on the tyres? Uh, because he's still got over half an hour of this stint to go. Remember, the minimum driver time for GT4 uh, is 58 minutes. So the GT4 cars cannot change drivers drivers before the 58th minute of the race. So uh, yeah, take advantage of the safety car and the lower speed here to look after the tyres. And quite frankly, couldn't care less about Morgan Tilbrook at the time that he's losing. There is Morgan uh, running through the double left at Puon. And uh, what a costly spin that could still prove to be for the Enduro Motorsport car. There, Marcus Signoretti, uh, where do we have him now? Third within GT4, Collard, Miller and Signoretti, the top three. Uh, but they never really separated. I don't think we haven't seen a lot of the GT4 leaders, but I get the impression from glimpses I'd seen out of the window, they were just as close 20 odd minutes into the race as they were at the start. It's not only Jordan Collard catching up to the queue, it's people in GT4 staying with the traffic ahead because it looked as though there was that Ashley Marshall's McLaren that was falling back quite a long way. Leaders come across the line then. So that's another lap in the book. And uh, Davidson, Ballant, Cottingham, Halstead, Malikin, Loggy, Ferguson, Campbell, Stuart Proctor and uh, Jones, Nick Jones, that's the top 10. The Team Parker Porsche, we haven't really dwelt on much in this race, but Nick Jones has had a, a steady first stint and that keeps this car in the mix, doesn't it? Ready for Scott Mulvan to take over with around about half an hour or so away from uh, the pit window at the midpoint of the race. Pit window is a, a bit of an anachronism, but uh, it's, it's roughly what you want to try and do. Get as close to the hour mark as you can. Uh, there's a, a minimum start stint, which is for GT3 drivers, 62 minutes, and there's a, a maximum start stint of 70. So that's your window, really, of eight minutes. But it's very unlikely in GT3 you'd let your AM do 62. You want uh, or the, the, any more than 62. You want him out of that car as soon as. The McLaren is being retrieved. There's going to be a... A, qu a quick uh, look at the uh, tyre barrier, make sure that's all right. Let's have a quick look at how we've got to where we have been to. This is the start replay, first of all. And so this was Adam Ballon's good getaway, stormed out of the chicane, grabbed the advantage going down towards La Source. James Cottingham in the yellow Mercedes, the two C's run car, tried to go for a gap on the inside line. That gap soon disappeared because Adam Ballon got out his elbows. Ian Loggy went to the outside line, trying to steer clear of all of the dramas as they came down towards La Source. Good getaway, though, by Nick Halstead, but then he got run out a little bit wide, and so uh, he uh, lost places. This was... Alex Malikin, who was under investigation for contact as they all sort of scrabble their way into Lecom. And then James Cottingham in his quest to get up with the race leaders just skim the wall there, going down towards Eau Rouge. And they build them strong uh, at Mercedes, and that car managed to bounce off and continue. Then we had, of course, Morgan Tilbrook being given a tag by Graham Davidson, and that sorted him out. There was also Davidson into the back of Adam Ballon, and uh, that is also being looked at. And then there was this drama with Michael Igo going for a gap that I'm not sure was there, and that speared Mia Fluit bang into the tar wall. And that's why, Andy, we've got the safety car out on track. Yeah, big hit that for Mia Fluit, and I'm sure Michael Igo, that's absolutely not what he wanted to happen there. Anytime you try and go side by side uh, through the Eau Rouge Radion section, uh, it's always a bit of a risk. It's why that three wide overtake from a few years ago was so amazing to see, because it's so, so hard uh, to fit uh, cars even two by two through there and we just saw why so Mia Fluid thankfully we believe is okay and uh, they'll have to move the car and possibly uh, redress the barriers slightly because that tyre wall uh, definitely was dislodged ever so slightly. I mean Mia Fluid in fairness looked a bit dazed when she got out of the car and you can understand why can't you now you've seen the hit so uh, Graham Davidson leads the way still with this Damocletian investigation uh, from Adam Ballant and then James Cottingham in third place. So uh, we know the team manager of Paddock Motorsport has got to go to race control. So whatever is in the system is, is making its way out of the system. 
and uh, a, tr a tractor there, which I guess has been sweeping gravel away. Maybe they're taking advantage of this safety car to mm. uh, clear the track. This was one of the concerns we had pre-race, gravel getting uh, dragged on to the circuit. So they've uh, been and um, uh, swept the gravel away. And uh, that's sensible stuff because uh, we were worried about punctures and things from that. And whilst we're going around behind the safety car, it's an opportunity to deal with not only the safety car inducing incident, uh, but anything else that needs to be uh, sorted around the rest of the circuit. So good marshal and good officiating there uh, to make sure the track is, is in race ready conditions as and when we get the safety car in the pit lane. Jordan Collard, Bryn tells me, is reporting a vibration. So the Toyota team down at Speedworks have just jumped to their feet. It might be that he's got a puncture. It might be that he's run over uh, some rubber and it's making the car vibrate. But uh, they are going to possibly have to bring that car in and check. And it would cost them the lead, but better do it now under yellow flag conditions rather than under green. So keep an eye on the Toyota Supra, they have some rotten luck with that car. It's got all the potential, it's got all the pace, but the results just don't quite seem to come. But if there is an issue, get it done, get it out of the way, get it sorted while we have the safety car like this. They're monitoring tyre pressures, Bryn reckons. And uh, yeah, fingers crossed for the Supra as there the rest of the GT4 field pours through. Yes, including Matt Topham there in the uh, Aston Martin, which uh, works its way through Blanchemont. We're going to get at least one more lap behind the safety car, I think. And uh, so the uh, GT4s have at least caught the back of the GT3 field now. Jordan Collard uh, ahead of Josh Miller and then Marco Signoretti, first, second and third. You can see there David Holloway uh, in the BMW. Uh, across the line, they will head on to their 12th lap of the race. Then Graham Davison leads for Paddock Motorsport. Second place, Adam Ballon. Third place, James Cotton. Fourth, Nick Halstead. And fifth, Alex Maliakin. And Loggy, now that he's back on the tail in of that this lap. group, I wonder how he'll react. Is he going to try and get a bit more stuck in? He was dropping back, certainly quite significantly, from the leaders before the safety car, David. But was that by choice for Loggy, uh, or is the car genuinely struggling for pace? I read it, it was his choice, just keeping out of trouble. He was you know, there or thereabouts. I think he knows he can turn up the wick. Uh, you've just heard Peter Daly, the race director, say the safety car in this lap. So we are good to go racing. Graham Davidson leads the pack. Adam Ballon in second and then James Cottingham in third place. Nick Halstead is fourth, Alex Malikin is fifth. He's the other one to watch for me in this because he had dropped back. Now, let's just remind ourselves what happened to Morgan Tilbrook. Look, he thinks it's an odd line for me that and then eventually he comes across the cars a little bit squirrely anyway. And bang, Graham Davidson tanks the back of him. But the net result is that uh, as the safety car is due in this time, Graham Davidson made contact with Tilbrook, who then in error hit the pit lane speed limit button, couldn't then select reverse gear. Here, the woes mounted up. Davidson, in the meantime, caught and passed and got into the lead. So he cleared the green Barwell Lamborghini of uh, Adam Ballon and has the advantage right now with an hour and 27 minutes to go. This is building up nicely, isn't it, to a real short, sharp blast up to the pit stops. Uh, it is, isn't it? Because we're going to have uh, under half an hour, of course, to go before we start getting the cars into the pit lane and a resumption of what's uh, already been a very, very entertaining battle, possibly with a few uh, new players up there as well. John Ferguson, of course, right on the tail of his teammate Ian Loggy now, although John, I'm sure, will back up his teammate a little bit. There go the GT4 cars through. Jordan Collard in that Toyota Supra which has shown some superb speed in uh, this race. He is, I noticed, John Collard on his second warning for track limits already. Oh, though. No. Uh, yes, exactly. That will uh, certainly be something they'll be chatting to him on the radio about uh, under the safety car. Good opportunity, of course, to debrief with the drivers after that first half hour, let them know of the situation and, uh, and give them a reminder of some things. Well, that's why he's got a vibration, because he's been off the road and picked something up. So uh, maybe they, they, the, the concern, again, is the track limit's not anything sinister with the tyres, potentially. Uh, right, so we should be able to go racing this time. The lights are out and Graham Davidson now will try to build that lead back up once again. It's going to be interesting to see what Adam Ballon can do to try to retaliate and indeed what James Cottingham can do. But you've got the very rapid Halstead and Malikin. Look, again, Ian Loggy, he's not staying on the back of the queue, is he? He's just quite happy to give himself a bit of breathing space. You can see uh, almost like a cash register here. He's thinking about points, how best to score, how best to keep out of strife. Yeah, and this safety car means that he's going to hand over to Jules 
Gun on a lot closer to the yeah, race leaders than he was yeah. going to be, so he doesn't need to get stuck in here. Uh, there are others ahead who will have success penalties to serve too, so he could gain some places out of that. Anyway, uh, we shall see because we, with an hour and 25 and a half or so minutes to go, are about to get the seventh round of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship back underway. Graham Davidson brings them out of the chicane, the safety cars out of the way in the pit lane, and the race resumes at the beginning of lap number 13, and Davidson with a good restart already with a few car lengths advantage over Ballard in second, likewise stretching clear of Cottingham in third, a very sensible and orderly restart until the braking zone at turn one, where I think that was Cottingham, snatches a brake and runs wide. There's a similar issue, look, uh, for the Greystone GT car being Campbell. The GT4 battle approaches into view as well, with Collard still the leader, and Tilbrook now trying to make his way through. And also having a dive to the inside there is Joe Wheeler up against the Ashley Marshall McLaren. Tilbrook ought to be, as you suggested a few laps back, be able to carve his way through the traffic here. This is Richard Williams' view, 18th overall. That's Tilbrook, zap, straight past him. The GT3 McLaren with so much extra pace goes storming through. So Davidson is ahead now, but Cottingham has finally cleared balance. So unseen, we've had that change that's been in the post for the last 12 laps, and finally Cottingham has done it. He's jumped through, down to third, then goes Ballon. Fourth is Halstead, fifth is Malakin, and a 10-second stop-go penalty for the race-leading car for causing a collision. So the stewards have decided that that is the penalty, and of course, it's being served under green flag conditions to make it more effectively of a penalty, because if it had been under yellows, then it doesn't have quite the same effect. I was about to say that the frustration there for Cottingham is that he's finally got past Ballon, but it wasn't for the lead, but in a way, it kind of was, it because yeah. uh, Davis is going to have this penalty to serve, so that's the decision made. Cottingham already getting away from Ballon, actually, uh, who all of a sudden, I wonder whether maybe he let the tyre pressures drop too low behind the safety car, because he doesn't have the speed on this lap that he had uh, when he was holding on to the race lead over the first half an hour or so. He's got uh, Nick Hulstead right behind him now in the Fox Motorsport McLaren, as there, Morgan Tilbrook, half a lap after the restart, still hasn't actually made it past the GT4s. They're not slow, these GT4s, but of course, technically, this is for position. I know they're in different classes, but they're not being shown blue flags. They don't have to get out of his way, and Tilbrook's finding it tricky to get through them. Well, he bravely clears on the outside there, doesn't he? The uh, Josh Miller Aston. Next target, Jordan Collard. So that's going to put him up now, uh, Morgan Tilbrook, into 15th place. And he started the lap 21st, so he's made short work of GT4. Has a go at the Supra, which has stayed out, of course. That hasn't bailed uh, under the safety car conditions. So uh, up front, it remains Graham Davidson. There's the man that he turned around, Morgan Tilbrook, fighting back as best he can. And we're going to have James Cottingham to take over the race lead once the leading McLaren uh, comes in to serve that stop-go penalty. But as yet, even though we've had it on the TV graphics, it's not been communicated on the timing screen. So hopefully it will be. Otherwise, I can feel a world of pain coming on here for race control. Down towards La Source, the leader's turn. Graham Davidson has, under the regulations, three passings of the timing line once it goes on the timing screen. It's not got on the timing screen yet. No, absolutely. So the team will keep him out there as long as they possibly can because his pace is good. He's stretching the gap over everyone but Cottingham. Cottingham was about four tenths quicker than him, nearly half a second actually quicker uh, on that previous lap. This is the fight for third then. And again, Balance struggling over the top of Radion. He's slow onto the Kemmel straight. And Nick Halstead now moves alongside him. The orange and blue McLaren to the outside of the green Lamborghini. And again, makes it look very easy. The Lamborghini doesn't seem very settled at the top of the hill there. And that's costing Balance speed up towards the highest point of the circuit here at the exit of Lacom. So Halstead goes third. And now Malikin draws in behind Balance. Allen, and this is significant because the Malikin Dorlin Redline Racing Porsche is only a point and a half ahead of Ballon and Mitchell's uh, Lamborghini in the fight for third in the points. And then it's only one point further up to Igo and Keane, who we know are having a bit of a disaster here in the number 18 Lamborghini. So uh, that fight for second in the points could be about to swing the way of Redline here. Uh, it may be a new car to them this year, but uh, Alex Malikin and James Dorlin, I think it's fair to say, getting on well with that car. And they're not that far away from challenging for a podium position. And that penalty has just gone on the timing screen, so uh, that all is good now. The message is getting through. The 10 second stop go for car 11 for causing the collision. Uh, and of course, it's not just the 10 seconds, it's the drive time, isn't it? It's only half the pit lane, unlike next week for the 24 hour race where you use the two pit lanes together. It's only the top pits. Uh, a really good effort, though, this by Jordan Collard, isn't it? Because he's keeping the Toyota ahead and trying to build that gap back once more. Morgan Tilbrook has got himself into 14th or had, but more places to go. Uh, as there you see the Cayman in the hands of Kevin Say that we have seen in GT3 Mercedes. He's doing the 24 hours next week, so he wants to learn the circuit, but he's doing it in a very sensible way, flying under the radar in a GT4 machine, but he's being given a hard time right now by the repaired Ginetta 
of Joe Wheeler. Assetto Motorsport had to rebuild this car yesterday. What have they got? A Bentley to rebuild now. Uh, yes, absolutely. That's the second time they'll have to take that Bentley apart. Put it back together. That's Maliki up the inside of Ballon uh, into the chicane, not quite taking uh, that third place away from the Lamborghini. But we know the rear engine Porsche gets really good traction off these tight corners. So Alex Malikin trying to use that to his advantage across the start uh, straight into La Source, peaks to the inside. That forces the defensive move out of Ballon and allows Malikin to tee up the switch back. But he gets a bit squirrely through the dip there and actually comes off the corner slower than the Lamborghini. Bagini down the hill they will head then and Alex Malikin wanting to get on with this because Ballon's already dropped 1.8 seconds to Halstead who is 2.8 behind Cottingham so Malikin will feel that he's got the pace to go up there and fight for the lead but that lead is getting further away by the corner. Uh, the team manager of Michael Igo's Lamborghini race control summoned him to have a word and I think we can expect something to come from that can't we because uh, if you get a 10 second stop go for turning a car around while in the tyre barrier ain't going to look good is it so uh, there looking back Alex Malikin who is taking to this Porsche very effectively isn't he going really strongly the British based driver comes out of Le Corme, but behind is Ian Loggy. That car eight seconds off the race lead. Second stint, going to be absolutely fascinating now. Yeah, and Loggy just did a personal best in the first sector as well, which does rather prove your theory that he was just backing off for the first portion of the race. He didn't know the safety car was going to come out, but you know, you need a bit of luck in this game. He's had some fortune this season and uh, managing there to use another bit of good luck to his advantage and now appears to be uh, wringing the neck a bit more of the Mercedes AMG. We ride on board with with the championship leading car through Pujol. Way wide goes Malik, and that was uh, outside of track limits, I would say, uh, through the double left. And Ian Loggy, quite happy, I think, to stay with them. He's not likely to get that stuck in for the time being. Uh, just ride along behind and try and pick them off in the pit stops. Back in GT4 land, Richard Williams here behind Jamie Orton. This position changed a lap ago, with Orton moving up into fourth place in the class, and right behind Signoretti, who doesn't have the pace in the race. Now, remember I said before the race, he was a bit worried about the long run speed in that Mustang. I think maybe his fears were valid because he's falling away from the leaders. Yes, he is dropping back, isn't he? You're quite right. And uh, Richard Williams also struggling to gain pace. There goes Will Burns. We know, in a sense, his travails are, are illness-related more than BOP. Uh, but up front, it remains Toyota versus Aston Martin. There is the Canadian, Marco Signoretti. Having said that he's losing pace now, it's where he is in an hour and 18 minutes that really counts. So, you know, it could be that the pace of other cars or circumstance bring him back into the mix as this goes on. Into the pit lane comes Graham Davidson to serve the stop-go penalty. So now James Cottingham has finally got himself into the race lead. Is this the time to tell him, though, that he was about seven-tenths slower than Nick Halstead on the previous lap? So that gap down to two seconds, and Nick Halstead is by some way the fastest driver on the track. Graham Davidson has served the ten seconds, now has to tour all the way down the pit lane at 50 kilometres an hour uh, to the end. It's a very, very tight pit exit here uh, from the uh, new pits, as they refer to it, at La Source, and a very tight blend line on the exit. If you go over that blend line, you'll pick up another penalty. So Graham needs to be careful now not to let his mind wander not to get too frustrated and gas it up a bit too aggressively coming out of the pits because then otherwise there could be another visit to the lane very shortly. Fastest lap, by the way, as there he goes, an inch perfect between the uh, lines on the extra pit lane. Fastest lap to Morgan Tilbrook, 222.8, and the lead gap now, David, is uh, continuing to come down. Halstead again quicker in the first sector. Uh, Tilbrook's being a star, isn't he? I mean, we come back to the fact that he's not raced at this level for more than 18 months and yet has, in a really short space of time, become a winner. Uh, Michael Igo is the next target for him, but I fear that Michael's tenure there ain't for long. So James Cottingham then now is ahead of uh, Nick Halstead. It was two seconds when they crossed the line last time around. Adam Ballon then down in third place. Alex Malikin behind it. This is Tilbrook to the outside now of Simon Watts. It's brave to go around the outside at Brussels, but it gives you track position for the inside of the next corner, assuming he stayed alongside and he couldn't. So Morgan Tilbrook backs out of that, but he's got the grunt straight down the hill towards Pouin to commit to the inside line. Simon Watts tries to defend, and Morgan Tilbrook, of course, the higher up the order he gets, is finding life more difficult to get through, isn't he? Because these are effectively quicker cars. Uh, yeah, Morgan Tilbrook with the bit well and truly between his teeth. So he's already passed Igo uh, into 12th and uh, into uh, now the wheel tracks of Simon Watts, who's running 11th. Then it's about three seconds up the road to Nick Jones uh, in the Team Park Porsche in 10th. You can just see the blue and uh, black Porsche going through. Where does Tilbrook make this move then? The middle sector at Spa is not the easiest of places to launch an attack, so better to concentrate on this exit from Court Paul Frere, get the run up towards Blanchemont. He's got a bit of a slipstream as well, and a good run through the viciously quick left-hander at the top of the hill could allow him to have a go into the chicane. He's certainly close enough. 
but we know that dirty air can be a factor. Mali can again on the attack here against Fallon. They're both clambering over the curves, and Loggy's thinking, can you please pack this in, guys? I don't want to get involved in a real scrap, but a real scrap might be what he has here, because Loggy is almost falling over these two now as they trip over each other. But he can afford to back off a little bit, because he's not exactly under threat, is he? So he can yet again if this is the game plan, temper his pace just a little bit. He is staying on the back of Malikin, who's giving it a red-hot go in that Porsche, causing him to Halster. The gap is down. It was 2.0, it's 1.2 seconds. Ballon is third. Malikin is fourth-ish, but he's got Loggy here bearing down on him. John Ferguson in the second of the Ram racing Mercedes is sixth. Oops. Seventh is in Campbell, and that's Malikin, who needs to reprogram his sat-nav to get back onto the circuit. He very nearly had to pay to get back in there. He was that wide, but quite what trigger that, I'm not sure. Uh, just had a bit of a moment, I think, going into oh. the right-hander. Uh, the rear-engine Porsche can be a bit lively uh, on corner entry, and uh, that just appeared to send him wide. And, uh, once that happens, it only takes the most fractional of wobbles through the middle of that corner, and you're going off the road. Thankfully, though, that barrier now a little bit further away yeah. from the edge of the track than it used to be. That's true. Uh, also, lucky carer, last, is being given a drive-through for track limit abuses. The point of that being that race control are monitoring this very attentively and are uh, uh, prepared to apply penalties. So do that again, Alex Malikin. You know, the, the totting up process ultimately goes against you. That was an error, I think, rather than deliberate. There is Michael Igo, uh, whose team manager is up at race control and I suspect is heading for uh, the uh, sin bin as well after that incident with Mia Fluid, but we will await. Oh, yep, it's come now onto the screen. Confirmation of a 10-second stop. Go penalty for causing a collision. And that one is a surprise to very few people, I would imagine, but that, again, championship implications because they were second in the point, so two of our top five teams in GC3 having dramas, the other one being the Enduro car, which has now cleared Simon Watts. I think Morgan did that on the outside, uh, into La Source. I caught that out of the window a while ago. This is the reason for the penalty for WPI. They were level going in, but then Mia Fluid was always going to have to turn into the corner. Uh, I go up the kerb, still got into the right rear corner of the McLaren and heavily into the barriers went Mia, who was among the quicker of the AM drivers in qualifying yesterday. And uh, unfortunately, that comes to naught. Uh, one quick point, David, about Malikin. That was his third track limits offence. So right, he is now right. flirting with a track limits penalty. OK. Uh, so that's the last thing that Redline need when they're running in a good position right now. Uh, I'm intrigued with Adam Ballon's pace because that seems to be ebbing away. He did a really good job pre-safety car at trying to hang on to the race lead. But now look, he's third, he's 7.3 seconds off second place and he's about to get mugged by Malikin who lines him up for a dive on the inside. Hold my pint, I'm coming through, he says. And Alex Malikin dives through on the inside for third. And Ian Loggy has a tentative look to think about it. But then he's quite content just to stay in the, in the little gaggle that they go down the hill once again. But yeah, Alex Malikin, that was a proper send up the inside. I'm coming through, he said. And boy, did he do so. Yeah, the Porsche's advantage is supposed to be on corner exit, but that was some supreme late breaking to get the position now for the race lead. Almost level as they go into Lacom. Big defensive move there from Cottingham. And Nick Halstead started second, dropped down to about fifth or sixth at one point uh, in the early stages, is now unbelievably right back on the tail of the leading car. Ballon trying to come back at Mali again. Race of the season this has been so far. We're not even halfway through. So much action, so much overtaking. You don't know where to look. The best bit for me is the variety of the brands that are up there. Yes, you're right about the racing but you know it's not wall to wall of one brand there's a real mixture up there uh, and it's good to see Alex Malikin going so well in the Porsche but here are the top two now they have benefited from all that squabbling and they're getting away Malikin then is up ahead of Ballon then for third Ballon fourth down to fifth uh, Loggy sixth is Ferguson and his Ram Racing Mercedes has dropped away again, even though, of course, they're all bunched up under the safety car. So it does illustrate the pace that the leading quintet have got. Jordan Collard in the Toyota is still leading in GT4 uh, from Josh Miller's Aston, and then the Mustang of Marco Signoretti in third place. Yeah, you just get the feeling, or I still do, that, that Ian Loggy is quite content here to drive at a pace and not stress the car. Uh, this is Will Burns ahead of Ashley Marshall, ahead of Kevin Say. Another borrowed car, that's an allied racing car run by Herbert Motorsport, OK? I think I'm following you, Good David, about. yes, yeah. just about, just about. <laughs> Kevin Say, every time Kevin Say races in the championship, though, he seems to almost overachieve compared to what we expected of him. We need to start expecting more of him, I think, because he's always quick. And as an AM driver uh -oh. at that, I'm afraid, is not going quite so well. Uh, that is the number 17 Ian Campbell Greystone GT car, the car with which he uh, shares with Ollie Webb, who is due to make his second appearance in British GT in about 10 minutes' time or so, but he won't be doing if the car is stuck on the grass.
And it could be that there's another interruption if it is stuck on the grass because it will need some help to be moved. The leaders go by then. So uh, James Cottingham still leads Nick Halstead. One-time touring car racer, 0.398 of a second is the margin between them as they turn now out of La Source. The McLaren's got great drive off the corner, but then the grunt of the Mercedes might just, might just, might just keep it ahead as they come past the pitch. Oh. They touch there. Nick Halstead with his elbows out. He's coming through, and James Cottingham has got to give way in the end. So Halstead goes through. That was pretty robust. He's off the road. He's back on again, but we've got another new leader. I've lost count of how many we've had now, at least three to my knowledge, and it is the McLaren out in front. We had a Lamborghini in front for a while, then the Mercedes, uh, then of course the uh, Davidson McLaren as well, so the fourth different leader of the race within GT3, and it is Nick Halstead, Fox Motorsports, after that brilliant qualifying effort yesterday, and they have got that appeal looming over them, of course, after the disqualification yesterday, uh, but either way, Nick Halstead into the leader now, will try and scoot away. Scooting away from the penalty box there is Michael I go having come in to serve the 10 second stop go penalty for that contact with Mia Fluitt and that will drop him now well outside of the top 10 inside the top 10 now remarkably is Morgan Dilbrook he's only 19.8 seconds off the lead and he's just taken seventh place away there from Stuart Proctor now let's uh, have a, a look at the lead change again in a moment I'm also just hesitating slightly over number 17 and whether it's got going again uh, because that car again might help Morgan Tilbrook if it can't get going and we need to have uh, uh, another interruption but right now Nick Halstead it is who is the race leader this is how he did it then so down towards La Source closing right up under braking and it was a tight line through the corner it was a really really good exit storms out of the corner tries to get up the inside and there's the little brush between them just as they went out of shot so Nick Halstead leads and we are unlikely to have an interruption in the short term because number 17 has got going again after that spin so uh, Ollie Webb will be able to get behind the wheel good good looking forward to seeing uh, Ollie out on track and of course there's every chance we could get another safety car before the race is done which would uh, bring them right back into contention uh, right dare i say it things calming down for the time being then halstead really romping away from cottingham uh, yes uh, there, there must be something lurking around the corner waiting to kick off but for the time being cottingham with a healthy lead ah here we go traffic we haven't spoken about no. that yet because we haven't had uh, it's a long lap we have that safety car cottingham out wide uh, the chicane just about gathers it together but catching traffic at an inopportune moment could change things around pretty quickly as well so uh, just as we come towards the notional pit window, there's a bit more traffic to be dealt with for the GT3 cars. Uh, that spin for Ian Campbell, as far as we know, is all self-induced. No traffic around him to do that. Over the timing line then goes new race leader Nick Halstead. 2.3 seconds to the good. So James Cottingham's tenure in the lead was not long, was it? He's dropped back in already. Malik in third and Alex Malikin also lapping quicker than Cottingham. So Nick Halstead's McLaren is the one showing the best pace at the moment. And the Paddock Motorsport McLaren is in 10th. So uh, it has fallen back behind Morgan Tilbrook, which was kind of the aim of the penalty. But uh, he is in the top 10. This is Ian Loggy's view, closing on Adam Ballon. And this is Ian Campbell up the road, just loses it. Yeah, that was all self-induced, wasn't it? And uh, Ollie Webb apparently has told Bryn Lucas that uh, Ian said nothing over the radio, so Ollie suspected it may have been a self-inflicted spin, yeah. uh, and indeed that is now confirmed. So uh, Ian thought he might get away with it, uh, but no, we, we have cameras everywhere, and the onboard there with Morgan Tilbrook shows how Morgan picked up another easy place. Now, Ian Loggy, still in fifth place, I absolutely agree with you, as has no intention whatsoever of fighting with either Malikin or Ballon, and there's good reason for that, because both of the cars ahead of us have success penalties to serve, so all being equal, Loggy will leapfrog ahead of them, or Goon on, who will be in the car then, will leapfrog ahead of them anyway. Loggy doesn't need to race them on the track, and if they can come out of the pit uh, cycle in third place with a bit of a gap over these two, you'd put your money on uh, Gunon being able to hang on to that. Go along with that. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, the second stint drivers, like I said earlier, it's going to be really interesting, and you know, you, you kind of think that all the pros will run at the same pace, but there's going to be some discrepancy if, you know, if you take a lap times of a goon on the Jamie Stanley, a Sandy Mitchell, you know, they're not all going to be on the same thousands of a second. Good little battle going on here. Kevin Say goes through arguing with the number nine BMW then. So that is Tom Rawlings, who is on the outside line. Kevin Say on the inside hangs on to 23rd place, leading the AM class in GT4. You talk about him overachieving. There he is. First time he's raced the car, first time he's been here, and he's leading his class within the category. He did drop five seconds, though, on that lap, so he's had a moment somewhere. Joe Wheeler has gone past him uh, in the Ginetta and uh, almost lost out to Tom Rawlings as well, so possibly a bit of an issue there. Uh, an incident involving cars 77 and 11 at Turn 1 has been noted. That was from lap four earlier on in the race, so before uh, Graham Davidson tipped um, the 
77 Morgan Tilbrook car into spin. They'd already had contact at turn one, uh, so that has been noted, but no investigation uh, further being made. So uh, lots are still going on in race control. Race control, a busy place to be, and as we tick towards halfway through the race, I doubt that Peter Daly has dealt with his last incident in this race. There's a lot more still to play out here. I watched uh, free practice one in race control yesterday and it's fascinating to watch how it all works. You know, you, from the outside, you get an idea of how it might work, but uh, there's a whole team of people there, you know, looking at track limits. There's the local officials monitoring it as well and getting the reports in. There's another uh, race official keeping an eye on all of the monitors to identify where there might be a slow car or a spin. You've got uh, more of the championship officials feeding the uh, message service that goes on an app to all of the teams to communicate both in both directions, so any message that comes in for the race director can be dealt with, can be passed up the line. The stewards are in there as well. They can have replays shown to them. Peter is on his toes all the time, walking up and down, looking at screens, looking at what's going on, talking to the teams. It's a very, very busy place. That's only free practice one, which is pretty calm. <laughs> so right now, it must be uh, a right old cauldron in there. Jordan Collard, you were looking at a moment ago, leading GT4, and there is the Aston Martin behind, which has got Josh Miller at the wheel of it, but uh, uh, Jordan is doing a good job still here. The team manager now of Morgan Tilbrook's car going to race control. I think you'd said that, hadn't you? So Jordan Collard leading in GT4. There is the second placed Aston Martin. Good to have the Toyota finally find wood to touch with an hour and change to go. Looking pretty good up front. But that Mustang, for my money, is coming back into the mix, isn't it? Uh, let's see what the lap times say then. Collard does a uh, 2 minutes 35.7, a 35.9 for Signoretti. So uh, the timing screen disagrees with you. But yes, I think over recent laps, Signoretti he's certainly stretched away from the cars behind him, hasn't he? Getting yeah. away from Orton in fourth, getting away from Williams in fifth and looking a bit more comfortable in third place. That car does, though, have a 15 second success penalty to serve because it was second in our most recent race at Snetterton. The podium finishes in GT3 overall and GT4 overall have extra time to serve in the pit stop at the next race so that will shuffle the order slightly in both classes that's lucky carer in the cayman the beluga racing car that uh, had the uh, drive through for track limit offenses earlier on and that is nick jones number 66 the team parker porsche ninth so you've got a gt3 gt4 porsche set there but of course that's a 911 ahead of the cayman the 718 iteration of the cayman gt4 club sport so down through Blanchimont, down to the chicane. The car's now poor, and we're edging towards pit stops, aren't we now? Yeah, a minute and a half away, give or take, from the uh, minimum driver time being completed for our GT4 drivers. That will be with an hour and two minutes to go. And with 58 minutes to go, the GT3 drivers can then uh, come in. Now, this is what are we seeing here at Corporal Frere. A bit of a moment, I think, for one of the GT4 cars. We'll get back to that in a moment or two. I think it's meant to be 66, which has got what had had a moment of some sort, yeah. like it had suddenly slowed. So Nick Jones comes through. His last lap was a 2.28, which in GT3 terms is pretty slow. So maybe there was a little glitch in the car, which could cause it to hesitate. But we'll get back to that, as you say, in due course. Now, Nick Halstead, absolute best in the first sector. There, diving to the inside for eighth place, tries to go Graham Davidson, but Stuart Proctor fends him off. Nick Jones is behind them. You've got to say, though, the McLarens have got good pace here. One is leading, one has set the fastest lap. This one's on a mission. We arguably should have had more of them at the front, though, because, of course, there's a bit of penalty for Paddock, who mm. still are stuck behind Greystone. Tilbrook's had a spin, uh, so Nick Halstead rather flying the McLaren flag, actually. 5.8 seconds now clear of Cottingham in second. Cottingham's 7.6 ahead of Malik, and he's 2.3 ahead of Balance. So those gaps all starting to go out uh, with Ian Loggy getting a sign that Ian Loggy might now just be starting to push, because he's just been given his first track limits warning uh, for running a bit wide on the exit of Blanchimont. Right, so this is Nick Jones, and we picked up a lap ago that he'd lost a chunk of time. Look for a blue Porsche. There is Ooh. a blue Porsche. Ooh, that was a, a big old slide. And that will have made his eyes stick out like chapel hat pegs. So Nick Jones having to refocus, and he's up the curb again. You know, getting to the end of an hour in these temperatures, bit of fatigue creeping in for drivers now, possibly. Yeah, certainly for the AMs, who you know, Indeed, don't yeah. do this for a living. This is not their regular job, whereas the pros are kind of doing this at a different racetrack in the world each weekend, and they, they're sort of used to this. Now, look at this. Morgan Tilbrook has caught, remarkably, the fourth-place battle. Adam Ballon is still fourth, Ian Loggy behind, and Loggy now has a real decision to make, because, OK, it's one thing to follow those cars and not overtake them, 
well, with Tilbrook arriving on his tail, he has to choose, do I let him go, or do I try and defend this uh, fourth position, fifth position for Loggy? That's going to be a really, really interesting dynamic to watch over the next few laps. So you've got there number 42, Audi, and this is the, the start of the GT4 stop. GT4 can stop before GT3 to try to stagger the pit lane, so that's why you've only got GT4 cars in at the moment. The uh, minimum time has not been reached yet for the GT3 teams. They've all got to stay out a bit longer. You're right about the Adam Loggy, uh, the Ian Loggy, Adam Ballon question. What does he do? Does he go for the place or does he sit back? I reckon he's fighting for this. Uh, it looks like it. He's trying to get level with the Lamborghini. Certainly Ballon feeling the need to defend. We're on board with Loggy then. Championship leader fighting against two of his championship rivals here. Tilbrook behind and Ballon ahead. Through Lacon. Very odd line taken by Ballon but he keeps the Barwell car ahead and this now backs Loggy up into a fired up Morgan Tilbrook who probably would never have guessed that he'd be fighting for a top five at this point of the race. He still owns the fastest lap. He's just at an outright fastest first sector with a nice slipstream as Tilbrook, and he's on the tail of the Mercedes. You've used that phrase, fired up, and that might just get Ian Loggy a bit nervous because Morgan Tilbrook is on a mission, and Ian Loggy does not need a missile behind him. He <laughs> needs points. So down towards Point, he comes. He is still defending, but Morgan Tilbrook now is going to try to work out where he can commit to the move. He has caught him in this middle sector, and as you've said before, Andy, it's not easy to overtake in that compared to certainly the run up towards Le Con, for example. So fourth, fifth, and sixth, you're looking at Ballant, Loggy, and uh, Tilbrook. And let's see whether the Mercedes is strong enough to repel the McLaren. I think he's just dropped back a length from Ballon, but he's got to now. He will drop back if he's going to go defensive. Yep, through uh, campus they head then, and the three cars pretty equidistant as they head through the two right-handers at the bottom of the hill and start climbing, climbing, climbing. Good exit there from Loggy, actually, and he'll have the toe towards Blanchemont. He stretched his legs there away uh, from the McLaren, the number 77 car, and is this where Loggy now makes a real concerted effort to try and get into fourth position, into the pit lane, meanwhile, Kumar leading GT4 cars, so Collard in, followed by Miller, followed by Signoretti. Success penalty-wise, the Academy Mustang has 15 seconds to serve. The Newbridge Aston has 10 seconds to serve and the maximum 20 seconds for GT4 goes to the number 90 of Will Burns. So it shouldn't, hopefully, affect the lead battle. So drivers out and the uh, refueling will take place. Pit stops for uh, GT4, 180 seconds. So there's ample time to do this, but you can't be in the car while the refueling takes place. So out gets Jordan Collard. The fuel goes in. Many of the crew on this Speedworks run, Toyota Gazoo Racing UK, Toyota Supra, are all students at the National Centre for Motorsport Engineering at the University of Bolton. And this is the ultimate classroom. Learn on the job, learn with a race team, whether it's about data, whether it's about engineering, whether it's about refueling, whether it's pit stop practices, all of these things. And Christian Dick, the team principal, has, has been very good with the university, taking on lots of placements for both this and also the touring car team that they run in the VTCC. Yeah, fantastic. A great initiative, that. And uh, they've learnt a lot this weekend, I'd imagine, with uh, uh, the changes made yes, to that car. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Nick Halstead then, 6.1 seconds, only 6.2 ahead of James Cottingham on the previous lap, was nearly a full second quicker than Cottingham. I mean, he's checked out completely now from the second place Mercedes. Uh, but they're both of their lap times dropping a 26 for Halstead, a 27 0 for Cottingham. Those behind are still in the 24s, 25s. And in clean air, Tilbrook can do a 23. So, pacing themselves maybe here? Possibly, possibly. And then you need to factor in again, second drivers, as here, Tilbrook dives up the inside of Ian Loggy into Paul. Let him go, Ian, let him go. But the Mercedes stays ahead. Morgan Tilbrook right on his tail. You can see how they drop back from Adam Ballon. So Ian Loggy is defending the plate. He is not prepared to just let that McLaren go by. Now that we're getting towards pit stop time, he wants to try and keep the car ahead. He wants to give Jules Gunnar the best chance of a decent result. I wonder if that was triggered by meeting some lap traffic. They just got past the BMW of Tom Rawlings. You can see there Tilbrook closing in. What an ominous sight that must be in the mirrors. The McLaren with its aggressive front aero reeling in the Mercedes AMG under braking. But on quarter exit, the very torquey engine uh, is in the Mercedes, the four-litre twin-turbo V8, uh, propels it out of the corners really well. He's on the headlight flasher, is Loggy, goes to the outside of Joe Wheeler's Ginetta to the inside, will try and go Tilbrook, that didn't work, and that's advantage, Loggy, that is a dicey place to be catching a, a lap car. It is, but that's only going to make Morgan Tilbrook even more fired up as they come down now towards the chicane. So are we going to have any of them in? Yes, Nick Halstead is into the pit lane, James Cottingham is into the pit lane. We wait for Malikin, in, 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 in. They all come, Malikin is in, Ballon is in, Loggy is in, Tilbrook is in. 
and behind them, John Ferguson is in. And this is where the pit stop penalties are going to shake the order going into stint two. Absolutely, because the 72 Lamborghini has a 15 second penalty to serve. Red Lions Porsche number 32 has 10 seconds. And John Ferguson there with the maximum 20. But interestingly, number six Mercedes that we're on board with, number 77 McLaren, which was chasing it, neither of them have a success penalty to serve. And they came in absolutely nose to tail. Now, yes, we have this minimum pit stop time, but if one team maybe gives themselves an extra seconds leeway and just waits for an extra second to be uh, to be sure that they're not too short on the pit stop time, it could cost them a place. So that is an interesting battle to watch in a minute or so when they exit the pits. Absolutely right. So the fuel goes in, the cars remain empty, then the second driver can run round. The other interesting factor will be to see if any of them suddenly go up on the jacks and a new set of Pirellis go on, or whether they're going to try to go to the end on this set of tyres. There is 66 Porsche in, and now the fuel goes to the Team Parker Racing entry. You've got Red Lines Porsche over its shoulder there, down the pit lane. So more and more of the stops cycling through. Can't actually see the work from our window in the pit lane so we need the pictures to show us whether people are changing tires as on track in gt4 Ginetta versus mclaren that's brave gt3 mclaren around the outside there so that is the graham davidson car yet to come in for the driver chain so graham uh, will be in this time i'm sure yeah he and ian campbell the only two gt3 drivers not to pit at the first opportunity uh, kevin say by the way is leading in gt4 yes that's because he hasn't made a pit stop yet but that is uh, still an impressive uh, little uh, moment for him he leads from joe wheeler and tom rawlings none of those three having made their mandatory pit stop yet either there is a tire change going on at team parker as you suggested david i don't think there's any way that the teams would want to run a full two hours no. in this heat on one set of tires they've got a spare set to throw on and that will be the order of the day i think looks like the red line porsche is up on its stilts in the background as well ready to go so yeah the uh, car 66 now scott Morvel at the wheel jules gounon and over his shoulder ulysse de Pau, the belgian local hero who's going to be racing an audi in the total 24 hours next week a new car for him they're really flying is graham davidson who uh, is a very very quick am indeed he's going to be in this type away goes gounon away now uh, goes james dawlin in the porsche now, that Porsche has lost out, hasn't it, on the pit stops with the penalties, as in comes number 11, Graham Davidson. So the race leader is in. There goes Lewis Williamson. So he is uh, still behind Jamie Stanley, who, of course, retains the race lead. What I wanted to see was where 6 and 77 were in relation to each other. Well, there is 6. Where is 77? There's no sign. Uh, it's behind even the Porsche. So that is a real game, that for Loggy. Gets himself ahead of the red line Porsche and stays ahead of the 77 McLaren with an increased margin, actually. So there, number four Mercedes, Lewis Williamson at the wheel, goes through Le Camp, and we understand as well from the pit lane that Ian Loggy has uh, said to Jules Gournot, now you can push. So the strategy might well be changing. Ian kept out of trouble. In has come number 11, as we predicted. So this is for Plowy, Martin Plowman, to take over, and we'll see what they can do to bring that car back into the mix. So it is Jamie Stanley who leads the way in number 40 McLaren, coming down then now into Pouant, the Fox Motorsport car. Jamie, GT4 champion many, many moons ago in the Ginetta that he shared with Christian Dick. And uh, the McLaren leads the way. Lewis Williamson, I'm expecting to be second in the yellow Mercedes. But there's nobody around Jamie Stanley right now to threaten him, is there? Big slide there for Stanley yeah. through uh, Fania. Not looking after the rear Pirellis on this outlap from the pit lane, is he? Uh, so Stanley registered third at the moment because Davidson and Campbell have only just pitted, but you're right, will be the net race leader and sets immediately an outright fastest middle sector. This is lap record time now, isn't it? As, as of the next lap, we'll start to see them dipping underneath the existing lap record of a 2 minute 18.8 set by Seb Morris back in 2017. And uh, Matty Graham, the GT4 lap record holder from the same year in the Maserati, I think the only black record that that car still holds. Purple sectors then coming in left, right and centre. And now the dynamic could shift. Is Jamie Stanley quick enough to maintain this advantage over Lewis Williams? And they can see the gap between the two of them. The sector times early on would suggest not because in sector two alone, Williamson is just over two tenths faster. Uh, maybe now this is the point at which the McLaren sort of gets dragged back into the pack. Let's see. Let's see what the starting point gap is going to be then. So Jamie Stanley to Lewis Williamson is 6.3 seconds as they go across the line for the race lead and what do we have for third place then it is going to be a long long way those pit stop penalties have really staggered the order it is Jules Gounon who is third so the lead gap is six seconds and Gounon's a further let's call it 12 behind so he's the best part of 20 seconds adrift of the lead
Yeah, Gunon was half a second quicker in the final sector there than Stanley as well. So there is Jamie Stanley then. Uh, he will, at the end of this lap, be officially reinstated into the race lead on the timing screen, but he is leading on the road now. There, Lewis Williamson further back. 6.3 seconds was the margin, as yeah. David said, at the start of the lap. Then a further 11.8 back to Jules Gunon, but that is a dream scenario for Ram Racing. They've got that car up a couple of positions and on its own. It's under no threat look from James Dorlin, who's 2.8 seconds behind him uh, in what will become fourth position. And Marcus Clutton now installed into the 77 McLaren will round out the top five. Clutton 1.9 seconds behind Dorlin. So inside the top five, this is the closest battle. It is. So Jules Gunnall has got to make up the best part of 18 seconds uh, in order to have a go for the race lead. That's going to be Ollie Webb when it, the car rejoins. We've also got GT4 to keep an eye on as well. And uh, there you've got number 17 blasting away. So Ollie Webb, who raced a Fortec Mercedes back in something like 2013, heads to pit exit. And here is Jamie Stanley then charging on. But what about sectors? He is now responding, isn't he, to Lewis Williamson. So this McLaren that's been quick all weekend, now that he's got a lap of warmth into the tyres, I think is being able to respond. And after Nick Halstead's really good first stint right now, Jamie Stanley looks strong as there. Look, Senate Fielding gets up the inside of number 65, the Cayman of Seb Hopkins. Yes, he does. And that's Audi ahead of Porsche. That is a change then because the Porsche was ahead before the pit stops. And the Audi now trying to reclaim the championship lead in GT4 goes back through. But up the inside again, uh, will go. Hopkins into the braking zone at Bruxelles. Thankfully, uh, Senna Fielding saw him coming, left plenty of room on the inside line because he knows the wide line gives him the momentum down the hill into Speaker's Corner, which is a left-hander. He has the inside, he goes through, but almost opens the door again on exit. Great racing. We have had the fastest lap set by Phil Keane. It's now been done by Jamie Stanley. It's now been done by Lewis Williamson. And here, Senna Fielding has to stick out his elbows to keep Seb Hopkins at bay. He might have got the place back, but he can't get away. And Hopkins is really rising to the occasion, isn't he? The less experienced of the two drivers that came in is going really well Jules Gounon fastest lap of the race two minutes 19 now Gounon is on an absolute mission and they will get quicker though they're a second yeah. off lap record pace yet and we know lap records have been broken at every other race this year both uh, Sen and Fielding and um, Seb Hopkins almost running wide into the gravel there on the exit of Fania uh, through the right uh, two rights at the bottom of the hill up the hill towards Blanchemont they go, and now Hopkins tries to get back in the slipstream to have an attack. We'll have to find out at the end of this lap when the timing screen resets itself what position this is for, but it's got to be somewhere in and around the top three or four in GT4. And remember that 65 squad looking for their first podium in the class. To the last stop they come. Now the Audi is just edging away, as there is the Toyota. Now let's just quickly catch up on where we stand in GT4, because to the timing line, as over the stripe goes Ollie Webb, comes there now Tom Edgar and the Toyota has retained its GT4 lead ahead of the Aston, which has retained second. Uh, now with Jamie Day at the wheel down towards La Source, you've got that new gravel trap on the outside line. There's the third and fourth battle, which is Sen and Fielding ahead of Seb Hopkins, and behind them is 91, which is Joel Erickson, who is a lap up in the BMW, Joel Erickson having taken over from David Holloway. Uh, talk about these new gravel traps. We've talked about the reprofiling and barriers being moved back and new grandstands. The actual circuit is unaffected. Runoff areas are different. The furniture around it is different, but the actual circuit is exactly the same. And how about this for uh, fifth and sixth and seventh in GT4, where you've got currently uh, Antares out ahead of the team Brit McLaren of Bobby Trundley and then there's a charging Darren Turner at the back of that as well so there's an awful lot to shake out of GT4 but what we haven't touched on yet in all of that of course is a Mustang uh, indeed, because it's behind this group, which is being led by Bobby Trundley and the team Brit McLaren. Bobby Trundley just went past Antares Al into fifth place in GT4. Brilliant effort that uh, from Bobby. Then Al gets sideways, not the inside will go Darren Turner, who now, of course, is a pro driver in the Aston Martin, surrounded by silver-graded drivers for the most part in GT4. And then the next car behind them is going to be Matt Cowley. So Matt Cowley running in seventh place. Seventh place, I think, overall within GT4 with work to do, of course, bouncing back after that 15-second success penalty. 
and that team, Britt McLaren, yet again, is there on merit. So there'll be Bobby Trundley at the wheel of it. Uh, wheelchair user Aaron Morgan doing that first stint, but uh, a really, really good effort by both of them. Again, uh, you, you kind of forget the whole ethos of Team Brit, which is to help people with, with disabilities to go motor racing because the car is just so good and so competitive, uh, and it rather belies the driver's experience as well. So it's another excellent job that's being put in by both of them. As 27 then rides the curb, Darren Turner, so he's cleared Antares out as well. Behind them is Matt Cowley, who is not having an easy time of it in that Mustang right now. No, he's not. We'll see what his race pace is like. His last lap was a 2.34, though. He was quicker than the cars ahead of him. Uh, I mentioned a while ago, by the way, an incident involving cars 11 and 77. Not the contact at the chicane, but an incident that was noted at La Source before that. Uh, no further action yep. on that one, so no penalty going... Uh, not, no further penalty, at least, uh, going the way of Paddock Motorsport. Bobby Trundley, then, trying to fend off Darren Turner, not only for 20th place, but the Pro-Am lead in GT4. Well, if he can do that, that will be a real feather in Bobby's cap. Uh, the charging Ollie Webb has rather split them for the moment, so Bobby Trundley will be able to conserve the class lead at least for another exit of the chicane, but Darren Turner uh, has won his class at Le Mans, of course, massively experienced driver, director of the British Racing Drivers Club, comes up to the timing line now, and that gap is coming down and down and down. I would suspect it's more when rather than if Darren Turner moves ahead into the lead, but Bobby Trundley is doing a really good job of keeping him at bay for the moment. Matt Cowley is creeping back into the mix here. Trundley was a tenth quicker than Turner on the previous lap. Yes, Turner had to negotiate Antares Au's sideways Porsche, but uh, uh, that is certainly not a slow lap there by the McLaren driver. There is Cowley. Cowley, by comparison, a 235.8, so he is on the same sort of pace as Trundley and Turner, and definitely quicker than the Porsche of Al ahead of him. The, uh, the number 33 car over the top of Radion, he will go. And uh, there, through the heat haze, you can see Bobby Trundley feeling the need now to weave around a little bit. Wants to be careful doing that. You're only allowed a certain number of moves down the straight. If you're seen to be weaving to try and defend a place, that will almost certainly get you a penalty. As the um, blue scully liveried car of uh, Darren Turner chased him down. You notice the uh, grey front bumper on that Aston Martin. That's because uh, uh, Matt Topham actually had an off into the wall in FP2 yesterday. We didn't catch it at the time, uh, but a brake line failure sent the Aston Martin uh, quite heavily into the barriers, so they only did that one lap in practice, and that's why they had to repair the front of the car, and uh, well, repaired front end or not, Darren Turner looks quicker than the McLaren, had a stab up the inside at speaker's corner, uh, but chose that that was not the moment to go for the wild lunge. So downhill they come towards Pont, and we'll see now whether or not there is a move in the offing for Darren Turner. He knows he's got 44 minutes to go. It's not an overall GT4 win that's the main focus. That would be nice, but it's the class win for him and Matt Topham, former Caterham racer. Matt Cowley is coming strong against Antares Au in the background as well. Uh, Antares Au, regular in Fanatec GT World Challenge Asia. And they're both being caught by Phil Keane. Ooh. It was a lap up as that wide goes Bobby Trundley and that's going to give Darren Turner a chance. Here comes Keeney, tries to get at the inside of the Mustang. Matt Cowley gives him room, doesn't want his own race to be impeded. Phil Keane jumps ahead of one, then he's got the Cayman and Matt Cowley might try to use the GT3 car to his advantage. And now Darren Turner is on his toes, he's on a mission to try to get past the Team Brit McLaren and together they run up towards Blanchimont. Darren Turner ready to strike. Yes, he is. Surely an attack is coming into the chicane at the end of this lap with 43 and a quarter minutes left of this seventh round of the championship and the Pro-Am lead battle in GT4. Uh, not quite nose to tail, actually, because Trundley was strong through Blanchimont. It is uh, telling that Darren Turner's finding it so hard to get past him here. On the inside goes Matt Cowley. He slithered his way through on the inside of Antares Au. And uh, can Antares come back at him on the exit? He might do, you know. The Porsche good on acceleration wriggles back alongside, but that now becomes the outside line for La Source. They almost bang doors as they come across the line right in front of our commentary position, and a bit of a squeeze there from the Porsche on the outside line. He's not going to go right round the outside of Cowley, though. And Cowley will park the boat-like Mustang on the apex and does indeed make the move stick, or does he? They're going to be together down the hill, and Antorizal does fight back, so the Porsche retakes the place. Hat tip to Antares out, new to the circuit, new to the car. That was a very, very good effort indeed, and he's gone back through. But here comes the grunt and go Mustang. Matt Cowley give it a squeeze. Ooh. He's up the curb, but he's coming through. He's going to have the inside line up towards Lecon, but he's got it done as they come out of the kink at Radio onto the Camel straight. Matt Cowley has gone through, but boy, did he have to work hard for that. He really did, and it might not be over yet because Al is trying to come back at him again on the outside into Lecon. Defensive line taken by the Mustang. This is delaying Cowley. It's allowing those ahead to get further ahead of him, and uh, this is not going according to plan at all. 
all for Academy, who must have been so confident uh, after their uh, crushing dominance in qualifying yesterday. It does now look like uh, Cowley has got the uh, better of the Porsche, though, and does now hang on to that place. Hanging on to the lead in the pro -Am class is still Bobby Trundley. Turner can't get near him, let alone get up the inside of him. This is a seriously, seriously impressive drive from Bobby Trundley, um, who is a relatively unexperienced driver, inexperienced driver at this level. It must be said, it was a big step up into the British GT4 category for Team Brit. He and Aaron Morgan, who had raced for a number of years at club level, don't think anyone really knew what to expect mm. of them. But here today, Trundley proving he's as good as anyone. Absolutely right. Very, very good effort. And he's also been a uh, very handy esports racer, hasn't he? When we did British GT esports uh, at the start of last year, here. here, up towards Le Combe, comes number five, eighth overall. This is Lewis Proctor at the helm of the car. Martin Plowman is ahead of him, seven. So, again, yes, they did lose out with that penalty, but Martin Plowman is regrouping. He's not going to gain much. The, the, the bigger disappointment, you could argue, has become the Lamborghini, because uh, although it did have the extra pit stop time loss, that car now, after Adam Ballon's efforts earlier on, uh, with Sandy Mitchell at the wheel, is down in sixth place. It was over a second quicker than Marcus Clutton on the previous lap. I think we're seeing more fluctuation in lap times now, though, as the GT3s carve their way through the yeah. GT4 traffic. But uh, Sandy Mitchell, uh, it was his effort at the end of the, the pro qualifying session yesterday that got that car the pole position and uh, still running in sixth position. Now, uh, as things uh, are starting to build nicely in GT3, we've got a close-ish battle here for the lead in GT4 because the our racing Aston Martin of Jamie Day is close closing in on Tom Edgar. The gap was under a second on the previous lap, and the Aston was a full second quicker than the Toyota. So if that continues, they'll be together at the end of the lap. Absolutely right. And the pace that the Aston has got suggests that it might be able to jump through, although uh, Tom Edgar is not slow. And behind them, you've got then, first up, the GT3 Lamborghini. Ignore that from the battle. But with the lights ablaze, Senn and Fielding is third now overall in GT4, and he wants to be up as part of that group as well. His last lap was a 2.34.1, so he is quicker than the Aston, which is quicker than the Toyota. So not only are changes imminent for the lead, there's going to be another change, which is the Audi for second, ultimately, and then perhaps for the lead as well. So here, Adam Ballon's car, Sandy Mitchell at the wheel, toe-to-toe uh, -toe now with Marcus Clark but he's gone through on the inside line. Sandy Mitchell is up into fifth at La Source. OK, and Mitchell is now about two and a half seconds or so behind James Dawlin. That would be for fourth position and more important points. And again, significant here that the 72 is ahead of the 77 because they're so close together in the championship standings. All of them still, though, chasing Ian Loggy, who, with his car running in third place, looks set to make this another good point-scoring day. And actually, Gilles Gounon is carving into the advantage of the similar Mercedes, the two Cs example, mm -hmm. of Lewis Williams. Williams and ahead. That gap was over 10 seconds after the pit stops. It's now down to 7.7. Yeah, it's not coming down much per lap, but it is coming down. You're right. This is Sandy Mitchell's lunge Ooh. to the inside line. In fairness, Marcus Klassen gave him racing room, didn't he? But Sandy Mitchell goes through. His next target, James Dawlin, in the red line bracket, Allied Racing Porsche. GT4, they're almost together then. The inexorable progress here of uh, the Aston Martin in the hands now of Jamie Day. He's getting it closer and closer and closer to Tom Edgar in the Supra. So can it hang on in there for 38 and a half minutes? No, I fear is the answer. But look at Senn and Fielding. He is getting closer and closer all the time as well. And the team manager of the Audi to race control. The team manager of number 42 to race control. Which is big, because as things stand, Stella Motorsport would get the championship lead back away from Newbridge Motorsport. If they have a penalty, that won't happen. Big, big moment there for Tom Edgar as he outbraked himself into the chicane. And now Jamie Day senses blood in the water. He's been significantly quicker than the Toyota over the last few laps, ever since Jamie's stint started. And he might now, for the first time, be close enough to have a pop at him into last source. Defensive line taken by the leading Toyota. And the Aston Martin searching for its second victory of the season. Uh, it mustn't count them out of championship contention neither actually Miller and Day fifth in the points arriving here at Spa a win would be just what the doctor ordered to get themselves properly into contention especially if there perhaps are penalties incoming for the Audi indeed so as there the leaders in GT4 swing their way up through Radion this time the margin between them when they crossed the line last time through was 0.226 of a second 
and it's not going to be long, is it, before that battle starts to take effect. But the Audi is the real sleeper in this because it's getting closer and closer and closer. But there might be another story about that, given, as we said, the team manager has to go to race control. Yeah, well, again, give you an update on that as soon as we get it. But normally, I'd say a good 90% of the time, when we get that message that the team manager is being summoned to race control, it is to inform them that they've got a penalty incoming. It's not to have a chat or to say, actually, no, we're going to let you off the hook this time. Uh, there is almost always a penalty that follows. So uh, it may not be the case this time, uh, but we will let you know as soon as we find out. Meanwhile, though, this doesn't affect this lead battle, which sees Tom Edgar still keeping Jamie Day behind him. Jamie, having done all of the catching, is not guaranteed to get through because it depends which bit of the track the Aston was doing the catching at. If Jamie Day was significantly quicker than Edgar through the middle sector, an easy overtake is not necessarily going to be generated by that because, as we've said, the middle part of the lap isn't where you do most of your passing. You need to be good down the straights. The Aston Martin weaving around, flashing the lights, doing everything you can to distract the Toyota driver ahead. Uh, but so far, it's not working. This is going to be a real test of Tom Edgar, isn't it? He has got to make that car as wide as possible for 36 more minutes. It is possible to soak up the pressure for that long. There'll be a huge amount of tension in the Speedworks garage watching all of this. But uh, equally, that Aston Martin has looked quick, and so is the Audi. Look, you can see that really carving into contention. And is that the race leader behind them as well? So Jamie Stanley is about to have to negotiate, I fear, the leading GT4 battle, or is that a different McLaren? No, it might well be, because Stanley's pace has really dropped. He's in the 24s, and there he goes, look up the inside. So he's losing time in traffic. The lead gap down to 5.6 seconds, but Stanley can see some clean air coming, goes to the outside of Jamie Day, temporarily splits the GT4 leaders, almost careers into the back of the uh, Toyota there, but Jamie will now get off the corner. A bit of a slide there from the McLaren 720S and he will now get himself into lovely fresh air and uh, try to extend the margin again. It was a 22-7 that time for Stanley and Lewis Williamson in second place will come through a 22-0. So the gap is down under five seconds, but of course Williamson and then Gunon will both shortly have to negotiate that lap traffic as well. Very true as the cars then now come out of uh, La Source. So there is Lewis Williamson. He is 6.8 seconds ahead of Jules Gunon. And behind, it remains Dorlin, then Mitchell. This is the GT4 situation. Now, Tom Edgar, graduate of Ginetta Junior Racing, his father, Michael Edgar, real Formula Ford 1600 gun, uh, is being helped a little bit by the Audi catching the Aston Martin, but little good will it do him because the pit stop infringement gets you a 10-second stop-go penalty. This is Senn and Feeling going through on the inside, and Lewis Williamson dives bombs the pair of them. So he's on his toes, through into second in GT4 goes the Audi. Uh, but, but it's short-lived. Yes, it won't stay there, absolutely. That's, this will be the second race in a row, by the way, that they've incurred a pit stop infringement because they sped in the pit lane at Snetterton and got a penalty that dropped them out of the points. It was their one and only non-point scoring race so far this year for Stella. They could have another one here, although they are a long way up the road uh, from some of the other GT4s. We'll wait and see where uh, Senna and Fielding rejoins the race. But, you know, you can win and lose races in the pit lane. You fight for tenths of a second out on the track. A penalty from a pit lane infringement will lose you 20 or 30 seconds so uh, a costly mistake to make and the second time they've done it this season so we've got battles going on everywhere at the moment there's another one in the background look because you've got sandy mitchell who's latched onto the tail of james dorlin now uh, jules gounon's fastest lap of the race prevails but sandy mitchell's done an absolute best in the first sector so there's a change of place in the post here for fourth as the GT4 situation to keep an eye on as well. Here it is, nose to tail then, with Jules Gounon hustling along behind them. So Tom Edgar is going to, sooner or later, I fear, relinquish the lead to a charging Senn and Fielding, who's then going to rel relinquish the lead because he's got to come and serve a pit stop. And behind them, there is Jamie Day in the Aston, losing out as Ian uh, Loggy's car. Jules Gounon at the wheel of it laps him. So it could be that Speederworks say to Tom Edgar, let the Audi by because it's got to make a pit stop uh, penalty yet. And there is going on through on the inside. Yeah, nervy times this for Loggy watching on, I'm sure, as the, his car tries to negotiate this feisty lead battle in GT4. But Gunon, ever the pro, is able to get through them cleanly and actually with minimal time loss, I'd say, there. So Jules Gunon uh, in third place, who has the fastest lap, 219.8, but still a second off the outright lap record. I think they are having to look after these tyres a little bit uh, in the summer sunshine here. Just over half an hour to go then. And this is how close it is for fourth place. James Dorlin in the red line run Porsche has been caught by Sandy Mitchell. Sandy, the fastest driver in qualifying yesterday, as into the pit lane comes Senn and Fielding to serve the penalty. So you sit for 10 seconds, plus the drive time, it all adds up as down now towards La Source comes Sandy Mitchell, still looking for a way past James Dorlin. 
So remember, Sandy has taken over from Adam Ballon. James has taken over from Alex Malikin. This is a fight for fourth place. This matters. It really does, and championship-wise, it matters too, because they're very, very evenly matched uh, in the point situation. Through uh, Radion over the top of the hill. A bit more curb taken there, maybe, by Dorlin, and then we could see that slipstream already starting to take effect, and they've got traffic ahead. They've got the Team Parker Racing GT4 Porsche not far ahead, and Marcus Klutten, I would venture, is catching them as well in the Enduro McLaren. So if, uh, if Mitchell doesn't get on with this, he could have company behind, inches between front and rear bodywork as they go through Lake On, but there is nowhere for Mitchell to go. No, indeed. And James Dorlin, who is a much underrated driver. We saw him in GT4 McLarens many years ago. We saw him in the Cayman Sprint Challenge winning that two seasons back. He's a very, very good driver indeed. Simon Leonard at Redline really rates him. And he's hanging on to that place against factory blessed Lamborghini driver Sandy Mitchell and just up the road is the GT4 lead battle where actually things have just slightly stabilised for the moment haven't they? Uh, yes uh, it looks like that gap's going out isn't it seven tenths of the line uh, also in the pro-am battle in GT4 Bobby Trundley's 1.7 seconds up the road from Darren Turner now so he's not just fended him off he's getting away from him so uh, a really remarkable drive this uh, from Bobby Trundley and still hanging on to fifth place overall in the class Sandy Mitchell then on the tail of Dorlin and this battle about to catch the leading GT4 scrap now where will they catch them? I think it will be on the run towards Blanchimont, which is actually not the worst part of the circuit to negotiate a pair of squabbling GT4 cars. So the red line racing, borrowed Porsche, hangs onto the place against Adam Ballon's car with Sandy Mitchell at the wheel, the Barwell Lamborghini. Now they split the GT4 traffic because here Dorlin gets past the Aston gets past the Toyota as well on the outside up towards Blanchimont. This is going to slightly go against Sandy Mitchell, who now commits to the outside, uses all of the available width of the road, loses a length probably net to the Porsche, but might be able to get that back down to the chicane then. And look, GT4 is coming alive again because the Aston Martin is closing, closing, closing right onto the back of the Supra. They are now going to be uh, monstered by Marcus Clutton's fifth place McLaren that needs to find a way by. So it's still a very busy racetrack. But now, look, Edgar is going to have to make that car as wide as possible. Yeah, down towards La Source they go. They both stay to the inside to let Clutton through. Then they merge back over towards the racing line. Uh, on the racing line is the Aston, but it was still slightly middle of the road there for Edgar. But that's working for him. He's positioning the car right. He's not slowing himself down too much, but equally he's not leaving the door open uh, for an opportunistic lunge from the youngster behind him. Uh, up through the hill goes that fight for fourth place in GT3. Dorlin and Mitchell, then Clutton, and there the GT4 leaders sideways on the limit. A good view there, David, actually, the difference between the GT3 and 4 cars. The GT3 cars on rails through Eau Rouge, uh, not the same for the GT4s, all arms and elbows, trying to keep it in a straight line. And here's the move from Sandy Mitchell to the outside of James Dornan up to Lecon. The Porsche brushes the curb. It gets a little tap in the tail, maybe, from the Lamborghini. So close, were they? But James Dornan is hanging on to the place. He needs to do so for 29 more minutes, just like behind. Tom Edgar needs to do to fend off the Aston for the GT4 lead. But nose to tail here. Out of Brussels they come. Dorlin doing a ripper job of being able to defend right now as they had left. Drop downhill out of Speaker's Corner. Yeah, right up to the edge of the curb, but not beyond it, because there is now a gravel trap there, uh, which will certainly hamper your run down the hill into Puon. Full commitment here, slightly earlier turn in there for Sandy. And you can see that gained in time on the entrance, but then on the power, the Porsche just gets off the corner a little bit more quickly. So uh, again, the gap goes out by a car length or so. On the brakes, once more there, the early turn in for Mitchell. Notice Ballon doing that in the first part of the race as well. I thought it was because he was driving defensively, but maybe that's just the best way uh, to get the Lamborghini Huracan through the corners. Turn in early get to the apex, just about scrabbling to an apex there was Tom Edgar. I think I heard a snatch of brakes there. Yeah. He is on the limit. Yeah, that car now does not look as, as quick as the Aston. He's up the curve. The Aston goes for the inside line. Edgar's going to go out wide. This is the lead change imminent, or is it? The Aston Martin tries to squirt up the inside and through it will go at the curb. Paul Frere there. Martin Plowman tries to find a way through as well. But we have had the lead change and Jamie Day goes through that up ahead of Tom Edgar. So it's Aston Martin ahead of Toyota now. Yeah, it is indeed. And uh, you can see there the paddock car of Plowman has got Lewis Proctor not far behind him. That's for position and Ulysse de Pau the local man, the Belgian, tried to get a good result on home soil. So that's maybe the next battle to watch for, because there, look, Proctor looks to the inside of Plowey. This for seventh and eighth and ninth places in GT3. And it is still Plowman who hangs on the corner at which his teammate Graham Davidson had the contact earlier on, which led to a penalty, which put them in this position where they're no longer fighting for a podium. But Plowman will want to try and hang on to the best result he can. Absolutely right. So they've recovered pretty well, haven't they, to get back into the mix. They're number five now. 
of Lewis Proctor, running behind in eighth place. Ninth, Elise de Pau. So he knows about Spa, but he's still learning about the Mercedes. He regularly races a Ferrari in sprint GT events. He's got an Audi to learn for next week in the Total Energy's 24 hours. But there, Jamie Day, having wriggled his way through into the GT4 lead, has disappeared. Look at the gap he's pulled in only two or three corners. Yeah, fantastic stuff. And uh, he is now looking like he's going to be tough to beat. 1.2 seconds already uh, is the margin from him back to Edgar in second, who is 6.2 ahead of Seb Hopkins. But of course, Hopkins has been lapping a bit quicker than him uh, over the last few laps as well. Right, back to Dorlin and Mitchell. And uh, Sandy Mitchell getting ever more frustrated here, you would imagine. And I think this goes back to the point I was making earlier on. It's one thing to be quicker than another car, but if you're not quick in the right bits of the track, it's going to be a struggle to get through. We saw when uh, Adam Ballon was leading in this Lamborghini earlier on, the straights were not his strongest point, and that's where you need to be quick in order to, to uh, overtake someone. But Sandy Mitchell is a very creative driver when it comes to making moves. Uh, Ex-single-seater racer, turn very accomplished GT driver, applying the pressure to James Dorn. All he needs is for him to ever so slightly miss an apex, and he compounds, but it doesn't come at the piff path. Now down to campus, past the college on the inside line, then into court, Paul Fratt. Look there, James Dorn just slightly further away from the ideal line, but Sandy Mitchell wasn't able to commit to that. Turn right again now, speed builds up towards Blanchemont, wide up the curb, but again, we've got with those gravel traps, people not running as wide as they used to do. So they are having a benefit in keeping people on the tarmac. This is the real track limits drama at Blanchiment. Two wheels up the green like that is fine. Sandy Mitchell keeps one of the wheels at least on the white line to get away with it and maintains the momentum all the way to the chicane, but he's still a length too far back. And Marcus Clutton is catching them on this lap, by the way, already about half a second quicker as almost contact is made uh, into the chicane there. But Sandy Mitchell, the longer he spends behind the Porsche, the more frustrated he gets, the more hot and bothered he gets, the more hot and bothered the car gets as well. He's getting no uh, cool air into the radiators there. He's tucked up, uh, inhaling the mm. hot exhaust fumes from the Porsche, the tyres and brakes start getting hotter as well, and that makes the job of overtaking even more tricky. Out of La Source they go. On that particular lap, Clutton was about half a second quicker than these two. He is 2.8 back as they go on to their 37th lap with 25 minutes remaining. So they flick now through a Rouge, and Sandy Mitchell had the speed there, but was blocked by James Dorling quite legitimately, and that meant that he had to ever so slightly lift, and it meant that James Dorling gets the advantage going up the hill, so the Porsche edges away by another length or so. Sandy Mitchell riding the wheel tracks, though, now. Closing is he as they come up towards Lee Corn. He'll have to break late, but, yeah, a slight gain of a length just about, but this is where the balance of performance really underlines how effective it is, because the cars are so, so similar in pace. Yeah, we're riding on board with Mitchell there. You could see the Porsche was not getting away from us down the straights, and likewise, they both were able to break at about the same point. There is Clutton chasing them down in sixth position in the first sector this lap. He is another two tenths faster than James Dorlin in fourth place. Fascinating onboard footage here, though, from Sandy Mitchell's Lamborghini. The way that these two cars uh, lap the Spa circuit are fundamentally very different. The Porsche rear engine all the weight over the rear axle. It's corner exit that matters for Dorlin. So he takes really wide lines in, turns into a late apex, and gets on that throttle as soon as he can. Whereas Mitchell turning in early, the mid engine car, you've got to get it to the apex and then hope it holds on. See it perfectly there, turns in a lot earlier than the Porsche. Looks like Sandy's going for the overtake. He's not. That is just the line the Lamborghini takes. And let's see whether it's going to be the case here again he's a bit wider up the curb but uh there again, slightly different approach to the corner. The Lamborghini looking to tighten the line, but there's no way through there. The Porsche is able to gap in by a length or so, coming towards the court. Paul Frere, clock ticks on down. 23 and a half minutes remain. Time has flown, hasn't it? There are more track limit warnings coming. Jamie Stanley leading now by 4.9 seconds, and first to third, which was round about the 15 mark when we last updated, and dropped to 13, and it stayed there. So Jules Gounon is struggling to really do much about the similar. Mercedes of Lewis Williamson, but Lewis is fractionally quicker than the leader. Yeah, where Lewis gains is in traffic. In clean air, he is no faster than Stanley and Gunon, no faster than either of them. Now, here comes Sandy Mitchell again, closer than ever this time to James Dorlin. As they race past the pits, Dorlin has no, uh, is no way he's going to leave that inside line open, so Mitchell has to go to the outside, watch for the traction on the exit. It's going to be hard to get better traction than the Porsche, but he has. Dorlin comes over to the right to defend. They almost make contact. Mitchell has to lift, and the uh, momentum is lost. But there's a yellow flag. There's a flashing yellow light because there's a car off at the top of O'Reilly. 
Rouge. So there's the yellow flag by the marshal. No overtaking is allowed. So even if Sandy Mitchell had have had the opportunity, that yellow flag would have gone against him. Now they are in the yellow zone still. Look, now it goes green, does it? Let's see. And now the move can come. It's Phil Keane's car that's off the road, look. So that's oh. the reason for the stoppage as Sandy Mitchell gets squeezed onto the turf. He goes one side, he goes the other. This is full commitment and he's round the outside. James Dorlin again with his elbows out, hangs onto the place. Sandy Mitchell through everything at that. And James Dorlin is hanging on to fourth place as resolutely as you can imagine. We are being treated to quite the race here at Spa. Some brilliant door-to-door -door action and uh, a great defending there from Dorlin. There was never a gap on the inside. Mitchell always was going to end up on the grass and that was a risk not worth taking for a car which ultimately is trying to stay in championship contention here in the Barwell Lamborghini. They are continuing to be caught up by Marcus Clutton in the background who in the first sector on that lap was uh, a good uh, eight tenths or so quicker than them I think uh, through the early part of the lap through Poo on they go and yes there Phil Keane clambering out of the second place in the championship Lamborghini and this is how he got there with a big lose over the top of Radion towards the barrier he goes couldn't see there whether he made contact with the tyre wall but either way the tyres will be flat spotted and Phil Keane he did hit the barriers heavily I mean you can count on the fingers of one hand how many times you've seen Phil Keane lose control that looked odd I just wonder whether he had a tyre that had gone down because in the middle of that spin I know it was a very very brief glimpse but I just wondered whether I looked at more metal than rubber on a tyre. But again, was that the result or the cause of the spin discussed? But yeah, you're right, Phil Keane does not often make mistakes like that. Meantime, the surviving Lamborghini, that of Sandy Mitchell, is still staring at the back of James Dorlin and he's running out of ideas, but crucially, he's running out of time. 20 minutes remain, just over. Uh, the gap between the leaders is down to four and a half seconds, half a second taken out last time by Lewis Williamson, so it's not necessarily over up front with 20 minutes to go. And this is where tyres come into play. Has Jamie Stanley punished the tyres too hard early on? trying to build the gap or maintain the gap and has maybe Lewis Williamson uh, just been biding his time is the Mercedes better on its tires than the McLaren so many factors uh, to take into account here and four and a half seconds is not a lot it's a couple of seconds less than it was certainly uh, immediately after the pit stops out of last source goes Dorlin significantly further ahead of Mitchell this time so again Mitchell perhaps now opting to just back off cool things down still 20 minutes to go he's got time to have another run at this uh, and maybe just wants to make sure he's got the equipment to do the job in the final part of the race. Uh, you can see there the Porsche really stretching away from him as they head up the Kemmel straight and the first sector times will be in very shortly. James Dorlin then about to hit the brakes into Lake Calm, a 40.6 in sector one for him, 40.7 for Mitchell and a 41.6 for Clutton who at this point of the race can't quite keep up with them. In GT4, it is still the Aston Martin ahead of the Toyota, but that margin is going up all the time. Adam Ballon looks on. He can only be impressed by the commitment of Sandy Mitchell, even if he's frustrated that it's not going to be a win. And that's a McLaren with a problem. Oh, no. And it's 77 with a puncture. So Marcus Clutton out of sixth place, heading to Brussel, and that's happened in a pretty grim place in as much as he's at the top of the circuit. He's got two-thirds of the racetrack to go before he can get to the pit lane. So, 77, McLaren with a puncture, and after all the hard work, climb up slide back down again. When it's not your day, it's not your day. And Marcus, Cl uh, Marcus Clutton is going to pull off there at Speaker's Corner and it will be a non-finish. So that's WPI out of the race. That's Enduro out of the race. No points for either of those teams. Both of them remembering this fight for the championship in GT3. Today could not have gone much better for Ian Loggy, could it? Because his car is in third place. It's 21 seconds ahead of the Dorlin and Mitchell battle. Third place will give him a, a nice haul of points uh, in this race. And... Uh, uh, yeah, Ian Loggy's going to be very, very happy in the Ram Racing uh, garage. Now, for second place in GT4 here, David, things are getting very tight all of a sudden. Because Tom Edgar has been caught now by Seb Hopkins, so the Toyota versus the Porsche, and Tom Edgar not being able, strangely, to replicate the pace that Jordan Collard was doing earlier on. He's got to try and defend this second spot for 18 more minutes. And here again, Sandy Mitchell is about to have a go at James Dorlin. They are nose to tail coming out of the chicane. Over the timing line, fourth and fifth they run. 0.200 of a second between them, and James Dorlin covers off the inside line. For somebody that's not done that much GT3 racing, I reckon James is doing a stellar job here. Downhill they drop, Adam Ballon looks on. If only he could shout more encouragement to Sandy, but I think Sandy's commitment level is high, just that the width of the road doesn't equate to it. Here they come, through a Rouge this time. Now the climb. Oh, 
big moment there for Mitchell over the kerb, and that will just affect his run uh, up the Kemmel Strait ever so slightly. Is the slipstream going to bring him back onto terms with the Porsche? I wonder. He's creeping, creeping, creeping towards him, but surely not close enough for a Banzai move up the inside into Lake Om. And indeed, he thinks better of it. Much better on the brakes, though, the Lamborghini. Yeah. The Lamborghini looks the quicker car. It's just making the overtake is a lot easier said than done. Absolutely. And James Dorlin, as I keep making the point, he's doing an outstanding job of defending. An incident between Dorlin and Mitchell is to be investigated after the race. So is that a brush between the two of them, a bit of contact between the two of them? Either way, it's going to be looked at after the race. And there, number 11, is Martin Plowman, who has got Lewis Proctor, and then Ulysse de Pau behind him. We're getting uh, the battle then developing here for sixth and seventh and eighth places. De Pau turns out of Bruxelles, and very nearly a move on the inside at Pouan there by Sandy Mitchell. Again, he thought about it, and then James Dorlin moved across and took the line for the corner, but Dorlin is doing a good job of soaking up the pressure here, and that's understating it. Into the piff path, again, different lines in, but everything Sandy Mitchell tries, James Dorlin thus far has had an answer to. As it stands, Dorlin and Maliakin would move into second place in the championship as well by a single point over Cottingham and Williamson, who would then be three and a half ahead of Ballon and Mitchell. So this battle matters. If Ballon and Mitchell can get themselves up into that fourth place in the race, that will be a net gain of four and a half points for them and a net loss uh, four and a half for the Red Lion squad. So this is a really significant scrap. Uh, they would be 38 points, though, still behind Ian Loggy. So Loggy now has more than a wins worth of points in hand over the rest of them as it stands. Yeah. Still 16 minutes to go. We're getting punctures starting to creep in. Track limits warnings are starting to mount up as well. This could all still change as Mitchell looks to the outside of Dorlin into the chicane. It's about the only move he hasn't tried yet and still it doesn't work. So what about La Source? He needs a good exit out of the chicane, which he does get. Now makes the run to the outside line. If he can drive around the outside, he'll be a very brave man. If he can't, he needs to break early and try and get the undercut. They do touch there. There's another rub between them. Dorlin's going to go deep into the corner. Sandy Mitchell switches sides. This is the move. This comes for fourth place, and he's done it. Finally gets his nose in front coming out of the corner. Sandy Mitchell goes through, and he has worked so hard for that. Might not be over, though. Can Dorlin get a good run over the top of Radion and use the slipstream to attack towards Lake Com? He's not quite as quick through that sequence of corners uh, as Mitchell was, and immediately Mitchell pulls to the outside there of Freddie Tomlinson's Ginetta, uh, which is uh, running towards the back of the GT4 field, unfortunately. Bit of debris on the road there, just in the braking zone towards Lake Com. But it doesn't matter. Mitchell doesn't have to run over it because there's no need to defend anymore from the Porsche, and he does go through into fourth place. Right, where's the next battle? Well, it's for second in GT4. Tom Edgar and Seb Hopkins. We know Tom Edgar is not an easy man to overtake. He fended off uh, the challenges of Jamie Day for quite some time, and now he has a quarter of an hour's worth of defensive driving to do to hold on to second place in the class. We also understand that Marcus Clatton puncture was four laps in the making. They were watching the pressures drop, tried to manage it, and eventually, Bryn tells us from the pits, it went pop. So that's another big disappointment for the Marcus Clutton uh, Morgan Tilbrook combo. Uh, more driving standards flags are coming for track limits. This is for second in GT4. So Tom Edgar hanging onto the place, and behind is the Cayman of Seb Hopkins. How many podiums in its life has that Super had? It doesn't feel like that many, despite the fact it's always had lots of potential. And up towards La Source, it comes there now. This is going to potentially drop it from second to third in class, but 14 minutes remain on the clock. But yeah, Edgar just hasn't got the pace, has he? And here comes the Cayman. Seb Hopkins looks for the inside line. Tom Edgar just able to stave him off there as they drop downhill. And once more, they flick towards Eau Rouge there. The barrier moved back a little bit, so they've got a bit more room to play with on the way in and the way through the corner. 13 and three-quarter minutes to go, and the lead gap is 6.1 seconds. It had gone up, but it's come down again in traffic. Uh, to answer your question, two podiums last year for the Toyota in the hands of John Ferguson and Scott McKenna, and one earlier on this season, uh, which they claimed at Donington Park. So they've had a few podiums, never a race win, though, uh, in the category, and unfortunately, that doesn't look like it's going to come today. A second-place finish, though, would be a remarkable effort. Their podium at Donington was a third earlier on in the season, and, yeah, it was two third places last season, so second in class 
would be the best finish in British GT for the Toyota, uh, but it's not going to be uh, an easily achieved second place, although a bit of a mistake there for Hopkins means the gap uh, does just creep out again slightly through the middle sector. And then behind them, as you see, the stricken GT3 McLaren is a GT4 McLaren of Bobby Trundley, which, as you made the point many laps ago, has been able to gap Darren Turner, so Bobby is hanging on to the Pro-Am lead. Now, his last lap was a 2.36, which means he's lapping quicker than Hopkins and quicker than Edgar and actually quicker than the GT4 leader, Jamie Day. So it's a remarkable effort, this, uh, full of praise for Team Brit's efforts this year, and this is a mega effort again by Bobby Trundley. But Jamie Stanley, GT4 champion many, many moons ago, is working his way for the 42nd time through Piff Paff. He will come across this battle very shortly. Tom Edgar running out of ideas of how to defend because the Cayman is looking a little bit stronger now behind the ready to strike for second place. It is looking stronger, but again, is it strong in the right places? The Toyota always has performed well uh, in the speed traps, and as they rocket up towards uh, Blanchimont, there is a speed trap there at the top of the hill, and uh, the Toyota, you can see, is stretching away slightly from the Porsche, which then carries more speed through the left-hand kink at Blanchimont, and uh, just closes back in again, but not quite close enough to have a go into the chicane. Through they will come in the background there. Jamie Stanley, the overall race leader, works his way past Bobby Trunley. But there is a bit of a, a wide moment there for Edgar into the chicane. And that means that Hopkins is much, much quicker off the turn. Drags himself almost alongside. But again, that's the outside line towards La Source. He doesn't fancy it. Didn't quite have the speed down the straights. Still, though, forces Edgar to drive very defensively into the first corner. Now, will he run wide on the exit? Tom tries to park the bus on the apex. Did he do it? Yes, he did. So Oates still ahead of Porsche with the leader, Stanley, coming through. Martin Plowman drive through penalty for track limit offences. There goes Jamie Stanley then, 5.9 seconds clear of uh, Lewis Williamson. That is the recovering set and field in getting back up past Matt Cowley. So 18th overall and in GT4 terms now, 4, 5th, 6th is the Audi. So it's all happening, 11 more minutes still to go. Jamie Stanley's lead is a pretty comfortable one. Yes, it is, and uh, the Battle still raging on here. Trundley definitely getting closer, though. Two and a half seconds back at the line. He was eight tenths quicker, though, than the Toyota of Edgar. Ten and three quarter minutes to go, so he's definitely still got time uh, to find his way up there, then. As uh, down the hill they will race. There's Lewis Williamson, still chasing hard in second place, but he's losing time now, or at least matching Jamie Stanley uh, through most of his laps, and that lead gap not going down. Nor, though, is Lewis being caught by Jules Gounon. There is Bobby Trundley, then who is the pro, in fairness, that is a pro-am entry, as we've said, so uh, it's not like he is um, uh, an amateur driver or a silver driver, but he's not a terribly experienced pro, certainly does not have the experience of Darren Turner, so uh, the fact that uh, anyone who can get away from Darren Turner, pro, silver or am, is doing a very, very good job. Williamson there slipping up the inside of Tom Edgar and uh, works his way through the final chicane with now 10 minutes remaining in this seventh round of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. With Jamie Stanley six seconds up the road from Lewis Williamson, uh, who is eight and a half ahead of Shul Gunon in third. And Sandy Mitchell, David, having got past James Dorlin, is only eight seconds ahead of him two laps yeah. later. Well, true enough. So Sandy Mitchell storming clear now. Again, maybe the traffic has helped a little bit with that. Lewis Williamson presses on. They had a win at Donington, didn't they? These two, the three-hour race there, and another good result coming. There is Tom Edgar, incredibly busy trying to hang on to second in GT4. Bobby Trundley is a coming, and now Lewis Proctor is being given, we understand, uh, track limit warning penalties as the cars come down towards the chicane. Nine minutes are on the clock. And as they turn into the right and the left, then you can see again under braking the Porsche closes a little bit, but Tom Edgar tries to fend him off. The Cayman gets the switch back, does it coming out of the turn? Bobby Trundle nearly with him in the McLaren. My fear would be that Supra could lose not just one, but two places before the end. Right, there's a drive through coming for Lewis Proctor and Elise de Pau as well. Jules Gounon's on the lights to say, get out of the way, but through he goes, clears the McLaren, clears the Porsche. Toyota will be next. They sprint downhill once again. Eight and three quarter minutes are on the clock. Yeah, and that delayed the Porsche of Hopkins just enough to allow Trundley to get right on his tail. So Toyota versus Porsche versus McLaren. Who is going to have the legs in a straight line? Your money would be on the Toyota to hang on here, but how does the McLaren of the uh, Team Brit uh, entrant compare to the Team Park Racing Porsche Cayman up the hill? 
past the stricken car of uh, Phil Keane, which is now out of the way behind the barriers. So no yellow flags anymore at this part of the circuit. And Trundley is quick up the Kemmel Straight. He's quick enough to force a defensive move out of Hopkins. Tries to go to the outside into Lake Com. He's up the curb. That isn't going to work, but he's going to have a much nicer line, you would imagine, through this right-left-right -right -right sequence that the momentum towards Russell could lead to an attack. Big slide by Hopkins as well, which isn't going to help. Uh, there's no issue, we understand, with the Toyota. It's just... Tom Edgar's pace and he looks like he's up to his pace once again now to try to fend off the Porsche to get second then in the category as they swing out of Brussel and drop downhill but in a sense this is good news the Bobby Trundley McLaren's pace because if that starts to attack Hopkins that gives Edgar a little bit of breathing space while they squabble downhill they come seven and three quarter minutes are left on the clock Darren Turner's Aston which had that brake drama and damage yesterday a long long way adrift now uh, Darren Turner Set for second in Pro-Am in GT4, but quite a long way back in real terms. Seven and a half minutes are on the clock, and seven seconds is the lead gap, Jamie Stanley to Lewis Williamson. Uh, Newbridge, though, still set to extend their points advantage, aren't they, over the Stella Motorsport squad? Uh, but it really goes to show how costly that penalty for Stella could be, because they should have been a long way up the road from Darren. Seb Hopkins there, much quicker out of Fania, tries to get to the inside into campus. Now, wide goes Edgar, and that will open the door for the Porsche, which nips up the inside. We'll have the inside line for Court Paul Frere as well, and Seb Hopkins does go into second in the class, but now we start climbing uphill. The slipstream will start to take effect. The power of the Toyota might maybe allow uh, Edgar to have another go towards Blanchemont. Edgar uh, certainly is in the wheel tracks of Hopkins, both of them being caught again by Trundley. A dab on the brakes for all three cars as they pitch it into the quick left-hander. Careful of track limits on the exit. Well, I don't think Tom Edgar cares about that particularly. He was way wide over the curve. Can he get up the inside into the chicane? No, he can't. And Seb Hopkins then does bring the the orange and black number 65 Porsche into second in class and now Edgar has to try and get his elbows out to hang on to a podium across the line they go six and a half minutes remaining then in the race and here comes Trundley looking to the inside nothing doing there again a late chop across there for Edgar who now does seem to be struggling for grip doesn't he struggling under braking not getting the Toyota into the corners as well as he'd liked, or indeed off the corners as well as he'd like, because Trundley's alongside him now, heading down the hill towards Eau Rouge, and in the end, it's quite an easy pass, so a slightly demoralised Tom Edgar finds himself losing second, then losing third, and now it's a question of whether maybe Trundley can go after Hopkins. Well, the pace that he's displaying suggests the answer is going to be yes to that, because he was almost with him, but yeah, the Toyota has had a strange stint, hasn't it? Some laps good, some laps bad, and of course it's very demoralising to lose a place and then lose another one for Tom Edgar. Down the pit road comes number five then, this serving the drive through is Lewis Proctor. Elise to power, he's up into sixth overall, but has got to serve his penalty as well. Five and a half minutes on the clock, that's Sandy Mitchell in the background. So we've got Stanley to Williamson, seven seconds. Uh, the ultimate irony in all of this is that Jamie potentially won't be on the top step of the podium because he's racing under appeal and part of the regulation about that is that if you're racing under appeal you don't appear on the podium so it'll be a vacant top step and we'll have a second and a third uh, right now Lewis Williamson and James Cottingham set for second and Jules Gounon and Ian Loggy set for third and uh, Ian who is the cardboard packaging magnate will need yet more boxes for all these points won't he because he's he's got another cardboard box full of them this weekend and another trophy heading home with him as well it would seem for a third place finish but that's not the trophy that he's interested in this year finished second in the championship the last couple of years as uh, Ian Loggy was going to let nothing stand in his way this year uh, of becoming the British GT champion and he's now pot potentially another step closer to it could go and win it at Brands Hatch next time out mathematically such is his advantage Bobby Trundley then uh, chasing down Seb Hopkins in the first sector, Trundley a tenth slower, but of course he was uh, still busy getting past Tom Edgar at that point. And uh, in fact, no, excuse me, he was a tenth quicker in the first sector, but then he dropped half a second uh, in the middle sector. So it's just starting to ebb and flow as we've seen uh, throughout the entirety of this two hour race, which is now just four minutes from completion. And uh, as they head up through Blanchemont Corner, the GT4 battling has been just as frenetic, if not more so in the second half of the race, than GT3. The first hour was all about GT3. After the pit stops, though, Jamie Stanley has rather dominated for Fox Motorsport, and all of the eyes can be turned to these fantastic GT4 scraps. And there may still be one yet to be settled over the final few laps. As across the line they go, and the gap is 1.2 seconds, two tenths slower that time for Trunley. But as I made the point, David, he was doing an overtake on that lap. Mm. Now he's in clean air. I think he will be a bit quicker than the Porsche.
Uh, drive through coming still for Elise de Pau. There is the race leader. Now, I mentioned that Jamie wouldn't be on the podium because he's racing under appeal. Just to go back to why they're racing under appeal, uh, this car was found after qualifying to have had a non compliance with the requirements of the balance of performance. Uh, so the downloaded data showed a non compliance with the imposed balance performance values referred to in the 2022 British GT regulations. All the qualifying times were disallowed and it was effectively put to the back of the GT3 grid. The team appealed it, therefore it races under appeal. It was put back to its rightful grid position on the qualifying time, which meant the outside of the front row. But because it's under appeal, another regulation in the championship means that uh, the drivers cannot confirm their position as the race winners, and hence they would not be uh, on the podium. And also there is a black and white driving standards flag for Jamie Stanley for track limit offences. He hasn't got many more laps to go, but he needs to make sure there he is. Fourth warning. What's your final one? Is it five? He's got to make sure he doesn't do it again. Yeah, well, we're hearing he is on his final one. I've not seen anyone notch up more than four warnings without getting a penalty. He's pushing hard. The car was sideways through Fania, sideways out of campus as well. Doesn't need to push like this, though, because he's about to start the final lap with a six and a half second advantage. So uh, the 46th and last lap begins for JB Stanley, uh, who insists on uh, bringing this one right down to the wire. It's going to be a bit of a nail biting final uh, two and a half minutes or so here for the team. Nick Halstead, we just saw watching on from the pit lane. Lewis Williamson, to his credit, keeping the pressure on as well. On that lap, he was about six tenths faster than the leader, but without a mistake or a penalty, a 5.9 second deficit is not going to be overhauled here by the two C's Mercedes, which is still on for a good result, though. It's been nice to see this car running competitively and cleanly uh, throughout the afternoon. Another one to watch is Senn and Fielding, who is closing onto Darren Turner. He's about 3.3 seconds back, and last time he lapped about 3.3 seconds quicker. So that's on as well as Ian Loggy heads up the hill looking for third place. Oh, sorry, Ian Loggy heads up the hill. Jules Gounal heads up the hill in Ian Loggy's car. And uh, between them, they're not going to end the season on the same number of points because Jules is only able to do a part season. But from Ian Loggy's point of view, mission accomplished. More points, job done. And with the opposition in strife, Nick Halstead heads across then to the celebrations, it's a strange kind of race to win, really, isn't it? Knowing that the car is under appeal, it might be a win that stays, it might not, but they're going to make the most of it as, right now, the Toyota has been caught, look, by Darren Turner, and they're both being caught by Seddon Fielding, then, as they come out of the hairpin at La Source, this is going to go right down to the wire, James Dorlin is ahead of them, where to look next? Yeah, this is why Turner's losing ground to Fielding, because he's boxed in behind the uh, very defensive Tom Edgar, and this, could remember, between the top two in the championship, the Aston Martin and the Audi, the top two GT4 championship running cars, and Fielding is much quicker over the top of Radion. He's in the slipstream and he's going to try and go on the attack. This then for fourth, uh, for fifth place within GT4, and it could be an easy pass because the Audi pulls to the left. It has the toe still from the Toyota ahead, and Senon Fielding goes through on the final lap, gets ahead of the championship leading Aston Martin, and that could be a big, big story when we get to the end of the season at Donington Park in a couple of races' time. That overtake could well prove to be the thing that decides the GT4 championship. In GT3, though, it is not a championship contender that is about to take a race victory, but it's still going to be a very, very popular win, albeit one marred by this appeal they're racing under. But right now, Fox Motorsport won't care because their car is going to reap the chequered flag first. Jamie Stanley brings the McLaren out of the final chicane. He and Nick Halstead are winners in the Intelligent Money British GT championship. Round number seven goes to the McLaren. A strong second place in the end for uh, Lewis Williamson and James Cotton. Him, but what of GT4 because Fielding's got past Turner, but now he's being held up by the Toyota. And so Darren Turner tries to use his decades of racecraft to get back ahead of the Audi, but Tom Edgar tries to defend us to the outside line, goes Senna Fielding into the pit path, he's done it, he's gone right round the outside, Darren Turner tries to go for it as well, he gets onto the dirt, he's up the curve, Fielding has gone through, Darren Turner levels with Tom Edgar, remember Darren had a spell in the British Touring Car Championship, so he knows how to get out his elbows, up the curve goes Tom Edgar, Darren Turner goes right round the outside there, they rub against each other, Darren goes through, brilliant racing, in sight nearly of the chequered flag. Incredible stuff. Darren Turner goes through just in time because Elise Depau is there. Elise never did come in to serve that penalty, I don't think, yes, he did. did he? Yes, he did. Oh, he did come yes. in. Good yes. news. Excellent. Must have done it just at the start of the final lap. So the uh, Belgian driver actually comes out just ahead of the Paddock Motorsport McLaren with whom he was fighting before. 
four. No, he's still registering as ahead of Martin Plowman. Anyway, we'll cover that in a moment or two. They do battle as they go past Sen and Fielding, uh, who will turn his way into the chicane. Jamie Day, by the way, has already come through to win the GT4 category. Plowman and De uh, uh, making contact. I think they are still fighting for position right ahead of Fielding. As there, Edgar goes around the outside of Darren Turner and might just pip him to the line. Who's going to get their first Toyota or Aston Martin? It's the Toyota by 77 thousandths of a second. Tom Edgar gets fourth place back on the line. And ahead of them was Lewis Proctor without a windscreen in the McLaren, or not in the McLaren, if you see what I mean. The windscreen wasn't there. Lewis was, but the windscreen wasn't. So drama all the way through. Let's have another look at how this all kicked off coming out of the chicane. There's the McLaren look with the new air conditioning system. Darren Turner and Tom Edgar virtually dead set level and over the line. The long nosed Toyota, as Andy said, did it by 77 thousandths of a second. It's another of those races where you feel really disappointed that there's this appeal hanging over it because you can't totally say well done, Jamie Stanley and Nick Halstead. But in isolation, they did an excellent job because they drove well. They, they did a great job on the pit stops. Good racecraft by both. And let's hope that win for their sake does stay because they drove well and they deserve that victory. Uh, no, they absolutely did. That was, uh, they've been quick all weekend, obviously quick yeah. in qualifying. Great effort from Jamie uh, in the second part of qualifying. And Nick as well, not uh, shabby at all in the AM session to stick it on the front row. And uh, yeah, they had the race pace too. The tyre management seemed to be there. They were just as quick at the end of the stint as they were at the start. And uh, yeah, despite fading to fifth or sixth, I think, within the first 20 minutes or so, uh, Nick Halstead fought his way back through, as you say, a driver with touring car racing experience, not averse to getting his elbows out and gaining ground. And it ultimately, it leads to a race victory for Fox Motorsport. Ben Halstead and Stanley win by 5.2 seconds over Cottingham and Williamson second. And Ian Loggie and Jules Goon on third, but the highest placed of the championship contending car. So as good as a win almost for Ian Loggie, he will extend his championship lead over probably now Sandy Mitchell and Adam Ballon, who are fourth in the race. Redline Racing were fifth and Ram Racing's number 15 car, having, yes, made two pit stops, but still somehow finding itself ahead of Paddock Motorsport in their fight for sixth place, which went right down to the wire. Then it was the Proctors in eighth. Rocket RJN under the radar there for James Kell and uh, uh, Simon Watts uh, get a ninth place finish with Team Parker's Porsche in tenth. Century Motorsports GT3 Beamer was 11th ahead of the second Greystone uh, McLaren in 12th. And then in 13th place overall, R Racing, Josh Miller and Jamie Day with their second win in quick succession get uh, the chequered flag in GT4 from the Team Parker Porsche of uh, number 65 in second. Bobby Trunley in third place overall in GT4 gets an outright podium within the class and the win in Pro-Am with Sen and Fielding critically finishing fourth overall in GT4 and that will put them now just two points behind Turner and Topham in the GT4 championship. It is smiles all round though at Fox Motorsport as Jamie Stanley gets out of the race winning McLaren celebrates with the team there'll be a handshake uh, with Lewis Williamson as well and uh, penalty or no penalty as you say they can be proud of what they've achieved this weekend. But the podium does not beckon, as we've been explaining. So uh, Jamie Stanley, GT4 champion, back in 2010. It doesn't feel that long ago, but it was 2010 that he and Christian Dick in the Janetta were GT4 champions. But Jamie Stanley and Nick Halstead together are race winners. Jamie is down there with Bryn. Well, Jamie, how about that? I know you're racing under appeal, so you can't take the podium, but that must feel unbelievable. Yeah, you know, it's the uh, best birthday present I could have had, really. Obviously, it's a real shame about the, uh, the appeal situation, but hopefully that'll get cleared up. Have you heard from Nick yet or not? No, not yet. I'll be, I'm sure he'll be here in a second. So talk us through the race from your point of view very quickly. To be fair, I had a pretty long race. You know, Nick did all the hard work, you know, it's probably the stint of his life. And with all the, the issues this morning, you know, he, he couldn't have driven any better. And, and I got in, just managed to get to the end. Well, look, well done. We'll wait and see what happens with the appeal. But well done. You've won at Spa. Amazing. Thank you. Brilliant stuff. A slightly breathless uh, Jamie Stanley there, uh, who was pushing on throughout his stint. The car carrying a bit of cosmetic damage after an earlier clash, which was later cleared up as no penalty. And uh, Jamie Stanley with an impeccable drive there through that second stint. May have been a lonely stint for him, David, but the pressure is still there. It was never a big gap over Lewis Williamson, and he knew that the slightest mistake could either lose him time by going off the road or perhaps even lead to a track limits uh, offence. There was the moment that he overtook, or that that car overtook James Cottingham's Mercedes and uh, Fox Motorsport able to pull away to the victory. Just saw Bobby Trundley there getting a huge hug from the team as well. The team bit, bit driver wins in Pro-Am alongside Aaron Morgan and gets a Pro-Am class victory in GT4.
third in GT4, which is fantastic, isn't it, to win in Pro-Am. And again, done on merit, great racecraft, but it is uh, a win in GT3 for Josh Miller and Jamie Day. They can reflect on that with Bryn. Yeah, when you just keep out of trouble and make the most of other people's mistakes. Yeah, and that really was, cr it was crucial that you had to stay out of trouble and make the most of people's mistakes. But, you know, you had to bring the car home and you brought it home quite nicely. There was a hell of a battle going on behind you. Yeah, I, I knew Edgar and me were going to have a little battle once I got past. I knew I had to put a few fast laps in just to get a gap. And then after that, just pushing 80, 70, 80 percent all the way to the end, just uh, having no risks of penalties or anything. That's great stuff. You've taken the record and you've, you've topped it by one. Well done. Thank you very much. Smiles all round then for the our racing Aston Martin drivers. Very, very happy indeed. And uh, those celebrations are going to start very, very shortly up on the podium. Of course, there are categories, GT3 and GT4. You've got the, the subplots, haven't you, of Pro-Am, Silver-Am, Am. There's a, a lot for people to race for in this championship. There really is, even if you're not going for the overall championship. But the great thing for us is that most of the GT4 teams are going for the overall championship. It's so, so close. I'd mentioned that Newbridge were now only two points ahead of Stella, but by my calculations, slotting neatly in between them now, is our racing. There are okay. two points covering the top three teams, and that Aston, with its second victory of the season, is well and truly in contention. There, though, is one of the stories of the day. Team Brit, uh, Bobby Trundley and Aaron Morgan. I don't think they can quite believe what they just achieved. Bobby Trundley is looking rather worn out, as well he might, because in that stint, he fended off and pulled away from Darren Turner, caught and overtook some much more experienced drivers ahead of him, and managed to get the car onto the podium. And he and Aaron Morgan are down in the pit lane now, Catching up with Bryn Lucas. <laughs> yeah, Bobby and Aaron, they're pretty happy, I think it's fair to say. Start with you, Aaron. Should we start with you? <laughs> Over the moon, Bryn. Pretty happy it doesn't come close. Over the moon does. I mean, you've been talking before, haven't you, about you know, that you've had podiums in, in the class, and now it's a podium in the actual full race result, Bobby. Oh, it's absolutely amazing. I can't believe it. You know, first year we're learning all the time, and it just shows how much progress we've come. Aaron done a mega job. The whole team's done a mega job, and I can't believe it. It's this first season, and we're here, so... Proud of the course to the team and everyone. <laughs> Do you know what? I think you will, but enjoy it. Well done. Great effort that. And on merit, wasn't it? That's fantastic. And it, it wasn't they lucked into it. It wasn't that people fell off. That was both of them on merit, on ability, on pace. And not only did they deliver, but all the people that you didn't just see back in the garage who got the car to that level of performance have done an outstanding job as well. Yeah, because it's a big step up for the drivers to come and race in British GT, an even bigger one uh, in a way for the teams. Highlights then of round number seven of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. Uh, how are we going to cram all of this into just a few minutes? What a race we were treated to. It all started uh, right on the first lap with some brilliant two and three wide racing early on. Graham Davidson for Paddock Motorsport was particularly punchy, making a brilliant double overtake there on Nick Holstead and Alex Maliakin to move himself into an early podium place. It was James Cottingham who was chasing down Adam Ballam for the lead early on. The Mercedes actually tapping the wall on the way into Eau Rouge and we had for a good 20 minutes or so a five-way fight for the lead which then dropped down to four cars with a spin for Mark uh, for the uh, Enduro Motorsport car of Morgan Tilbrook out of contact from Graham Davidson. Davidson then made friends with Adam Ballon. Paint traded between the two as they fought for the lead out of the chicane. Davidson would eventually find a way through not before, there was a scary accident for Mia Fluitt, tagged into contact by Michael Igo. Igo later penalised for that, with Fluitt's penalty being a non-finish in the tyres at the top of Radion. For the lead battle then, it was brilliant, brilliant door-to-door -door racing, literally, uh, between Nick Halstead and James Cottingham, with Halstead making his way through on the run into Eau Rouge and pulling clear before the pit stops, which happened midway through the race. There were success penalties to be served for a number of front-running cars, uh, which meant that, in the end, the Enduro car would temporarily gain some ground. They were actually back into the top five for a while, despite that early spin. Sandy Mitchell, though, was fastest in qualifying yesterday of the pros in GT3, and he was making good on that promise of pace in the race, moving forwards in the second half of it, whilst Team Brick within GT4 were trying desperately to hang on to a Pro-Am class victory. Bobby Trumley had down.
Aaron Turner, of all people, chomping at the bit to try and get through, fighting for the class lead, and both of them gaining on the overall GT4 podium runners at the same time. Then, a mistake, possibly, for Phil Keane. Certainly a spin at the top of Radion, off into the barriers went the WPI Lamborghini, and from second place in the championship, it was a non-score here in Belgium for a team that really needed a good result. The GT4 battling for much of the final half now was centred around Tom Edgar's Toyota, who had lost the lead to the R Racing Aston Martin and then succumbed to the pressure from the Team Parker Racing Porsche and uh, dropped down into third and would ultimately lose more places before the flag. Fox Motorsport, though, will take a victory on the road here at Spa to claim a race win in round number seven of the championship, with Jamie Stanley hanging on through the final part of the race to claim a very, very good race win. So that was round seven of the championship, David. I mean, so much to unpack after that one. Brilliant racing, little bit of controversy here and there as well. And a championship picture that certainly in GT4 has tightened up an awful lot in GT3. Ian Loggy, though, will now head to Brands Hatch in September with one eye on clinching the championship around early. Got one hand on the trophy, you could argue. He's just done an outstanding job uh, all season. The car has, has been incredibly well prepared as well. Ram Racing has done a, a great job. We've still got drivers going to see the race director, Sandy. Mitchell and James Dorlin have been summoned to be there at five past three prompt. So uh, keep an eye to British GT websites and, and social media feeds because the story may not necessarily be over. But uh, in terms of the standings provisionally, for all the reasons we've explained, Ian Loggy now has 123 points of the 84 of James Cottingham and Lewis Williamson, who are only half up on Adam Ballon and Sandy Mitchell, who are only one and a half up on Alex Malikin and James Dorlin. Then it's Nick Halstead ahead of Michael Igo and Phil Keane. Jamie Stanley comes next, which will go on Marcus Clapham, Morgan Tilbrook and Callum McLeod rounding out the leading order in GT3. 39 points, the advantage for Loggy. 37 and a half available for a race win. And there are two more race wins available this year. He could well wrap it up at Brands Hatch. And there is Ian stood alongside Jules Gounon on the podium as the podium celebrations begin, as we've documented, minus Fox Motorsport because they were racing under that appeal. But the others can go up there and celebrate. And Gounon and Loggy uh, are uh, looking a little perplexed, perhaps, as to why they're not being joined by a third team. But they and two Cs uh, will now go. And uh, if no one else is stood on the top step we may as well go up there for our pictures uh, and the uh, very very fancy uh, spa francorchamps um, trophies held aloft by them and now time for the champagne to be sprayed ian loggy has done this before uh, sorry jules gunon has done this before waste no time in getting uh, his uh, teammate who couldn't quite escape in time and uh, celebrations then for the two mercedes teams there that are able to make their way onto the podium I know we've become uh, flag wearers as Jules Gounal, but he just does an excellent job, doesn't he? He drops back into a team, a different co-driver, does the job properly. You can see he gets on with Ian Loggy. He's a, a charming bloke, Jules Gounal, and he delivers, and he's yet again helped to bring that car home, to bring the points. Uh, James Cottingham continues to impress. James, I, I know I bang on about this, but he's one of the real stars of historic motor racing, and uh, in modern-day GT cars goes really well also. But, yeah, Brands Hatch and Donington to come. Just want a longer season, don't we? Yes, uh, Brands Hatch is going to be a very, very tense weekend for Loggy. Not always been the best circuit for the Mercedes, though. It's traditionally mm. the mid-engine McLarens and Lamborghinis who are strong there. Spa, on the other hand, always has suited the AMGs. So, you know, he's not guaranteed to go there and win it. But even if he can leave Donington with a 20-odd point advantage, that will put him in a really, really good place going to the Donington decider. Uh, right then, next podium presentation underway. You can see there Elise Depau making his way up uh, onto the second step of of the podium and uh, at least a power shame he got that penalty there towards the end of the race because uh, he was just getting into a really good fight with martin plowman and uh, ultimately that sort of decided it in the end but uh, does at least get onto the class podium yeah i don't think it's, it cost him much in terms of the class result but no. it's a class win for alex mannequin and james dorlin in silver am and uh, the red line drivers very very happy indeed so uh, James Dorlin and Alex Malikin ahead of Elise Depau and John Ferguson. And because they also got a penalty, uh, Stewart and uh, Lewis Proctor finishing in third in class. So uh, champagne to be sprayed by Elise Depau, the Belgian driver on home soil. Getting uh, a fair old soaking. But, yeah, good effort by James Dorlin, certainly in that stint. And the red line 
uh, run, Allied Racing owned Porsche, turning out to be the better of the two in GT3, with the Team Parker racing car finishing a little bit further down the order. Yeah, but they were quick with the Lambo as well. They've had a couple oh, yeah. of podiums yeah. earlier on this season, so it doesn't seem to matter what car you plug them into. They're always there or thereabouts, those two. And uh, Alex Malley can much improve these days. He documented uh, James Dorlin's experience through uh, various one well, mate categories and then GT4 uh, for a season or two as well. And uh, yeah, nice to see them consistently going about their business. They've never looked likely to win a race this year necessarily, but you don't have to win races always uh, in order to challenge for a championship uh, right then gt4 and uh, this is the overall gt4 podium an enormous cheer rings out around the spa francochamps pit area there for team brit as they come up third uh, and uh, then the top two within the gt4 class ahead of them as well and it's nice to end our broadcast here from spa with a real feel good story the gt4 podium there for team brit the first of many you would uh, believe based on the speed they've had. They also won, of course, in the Pro-Am category, beating Newbridge Motorsport uh, in uh, what was a dramatic second half of the race. Fantastic stuff here then from uh, Spa Frankenstein the seventh round of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship completed. A victory on the road, at least, for Fox Motorsport. We're heading to Brands Hatch in September for the penultimate round of the championship. <laughs>